the Armenian Genocide. At the beginning of World War I in 1914, over 2 million Armenians lived in the fading Ottoman Empire. By 1922, there were fewer than 400,000. The others, over 1.5 million, killed by a systematic plan developed by the Ottomans' Young Turks Party, given the acronym the CUP. They wanted a state composed of nothing but Turkish Muslims, and the Christian Armenians were one of the largest minority groups standing in the way of that. Involved in yet another war with Russia, when World War I kicked off, the Turks killed Armenians under the pretense that if they didn't, the Armenians would rise up and join the Russian attackers. Hundreds of thousands of Armenians were made to march to the desert, with many dying along the way, not just from starvation and illness, but from brutal massacres carried out by Ottoman agents who would then rob them of their few possessions. Hundreds of thousands of others were not killed under the pretense of deportation. They were just butchered in their villages, homes, in the streets. Over 100 years later, the modern-day Turkish government continues to deny that the collected acts of violence against the Armenians was truly a genocide. They protest that it was nothing more than spontaneous violence, an unfortunate result of wartime confusion and definitely not government-sanctioned. And they're lying. They've been lying about it for so long. The Armenian genocide of the early 20th century wasn't even the first time the Turks had attempted to wipe out the Armenians. They'd killed a few hundred thousand other unarmed Armenians just two decades before. There's no debate, no controversy, no confusion. The Ottoman Empire was ruthless. Their government was led by pan-Turkish butchers for decades. Their mistreatment of the Armenians goes back centuries. But what they did during World War I went beyond the scope of any of the many human rights violations they've committed and continue to commit. In the final years of the Ottoman Empire, rulers desperate to cling to some semblance of former glory and power tried to answer once and for all what they called the Armenian question, a state-sanctioned and state-led genocide. Modern historians not living in Turkey all seem to agree that the thousands of eyewitness accounts given by Armenians and others who were there are not lies and propaganda. Horrific sights were witnessed by many, like rivers carrying thousands of severed heads downstream. It happened, and not all that long ago. Hitler took notes. In a memo to his army commanders on August 22, 1939, the former German Fuhrer wrote, Thus for the time being, I have sent to the East only my death's head units with the orders to kill without pity or mercy all men, women, and children of Polish race or language. Only in such a way will we win the vital space that we need. Who still talks nowadays about the Armenians? We do, motherfuckers. We talk about the Armenians today and we refu refuse to accept Turkey's continual lies on a dark and detailed those who forget history are doomed to repeat it and we really don't want to repeat this edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. Hop on in here. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles, and you might want to play some Michael motherfucking McDonald after today's suck to kind of cleanse kind of lighten things back up. This shit is crazy. One of the most fascinating episodes uh, I've ever been a part of in the four and a half years of this show. Just really, really pulled me in. Just so eye-opening. And just, I'm still just so so much in awe of how did I not know uh, so much of this? Almost, you know, I knew almost none of this before. It's it's crazy how much of this has been hidden. Uh, I'm Dan Kelman's the, the master sucker, the prophet of Nimrod. You are listening to Time Suck. Uh, real quick, before we get into the uh, show, two quick announcements. Uh, one, new Can Dumbins House of Flying Snakes tea in the store today at badmagicmerch.com. <laughs> Woo! What kind of idiot doesn't know flying snakes are very real? Can Dumbins! Uh, seriously, uh, we have a Can Dumbins shirt, and it's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. Also excited to announce the February charity donation. Thanks, Space Lizards, for helping us here at Bad Magic Productions. Uh, donate $12,200 to nokidhungry.org. Uh, before the pandemic, millions of hungry kids relied on school for food. And with many schools remaining closed, children are missing the meals they need. And with many parents out of work, more kids in the U.S. are hungry than they've been in recent memory. As a child hunger organization, ending childhood hunger is the primary focus of nokidhungry.org. They also do lots of other uh, great additional work. It's a fantastic charity. This donation is going to help them out a ton. To find out more, to maybe donate more yourself, go to nokidhungry.org. Link in the episode description. And now, uh, after talking about giving some help to those who need it, we must go bear witness to the horror that was the Armenian genocide when those who needed so much help did not receive it. Yeah. 
The Armenian Genocide isn't nearly as well known as the Holocaust, not because it was less horrific, but because it hasn't been acknowledged in the same way, not at all. And most of the lack of that acknowledgement has stemmed from the Turkish government, continues to stem from the Turkish government. As I pointed out in the show's open, they just won't confess, despite a preposterous amount of evidence. Turkey refuses to acknowledge it to this day, and due to fear of them severing diplomatic relations with any country that does acknowledge it, much of the rest of the world has also refused to explicitly acknowledge that a true genocide occurred, at least until very recently, as in like the last couple of years, as in a century after it happened. Uh, more on how the rest of the world deals with and has dealt with Turkey towards the end of today's show. In addition to Turkey's century-old continual denial, another reason that the international community has been reluctant to accept that the term Armenian genocide has happened, or at least was reluctant initially to accept that it happened, was because the term genocide hadn't been coined when it occurred. Uh, the man who would go on to invent the word genocide, uh, Raphael Lemkin, a lawyer of Polish-Jewish origin, was inspired to investigate government-sponsored mass murder directly because of the accounts of the massacres of Armenians and other ethnic Christians in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Lemkin, another awesome Polish meat sack. Damn it, it keeps getting harder and harder to make jokes about the Polish. So many of Europe's greatest hearts and noblest minds do, in fact, seem to be Polish. Maybe I should start making fun of Norwegians instead. I'm part, of, I'm part Norwegian, right? That makes it okay, right? I mean, I gotta say, not a lot of Norwegians come up with these sucks. What's going on there? What the hell have they been up to besides zipping around on roller skis? eating brown cheese. Those are both very real Norwegian things, by the way. Uh, anyways, Lemkin did not coin the word genocide until 1943, applying it to Nazi Germany's treatment of Jews in a book he published the following year. But he started thinking about it because of the Armenian genocide. Uh, he also applied the word to what happened to the Armenians, uh, and that really pissed off the Turkish government, who have refused to acknowledge the existence of that word ever since, at least in terms, uh, you know, applying it to them. Uh, the term genocide is such a taboo and shameful word because of the weight it carries. So taboo because of the outright evil, the accusation of committing it conveys that a group of people, typically a government, actually uh, planned and carried out, or at least attempted to carry out, the utter annihilation of a nationality or ethnic group. It's about as evil and cold-blooded as you can get. Genocide is the ultimate state crime. And it almost always is a state crime because generally only a government has the resources to carry out such a mass system of destruction. There isn't anything worse a government can do to a group of people than to kill them, than to try to kill all of them. Uh, maybe this is why the government of Turkey continues to claim that the Armenian genocide just, you know, never happened. Maybe they just don't want to accept that their predecessors, their great-great-grandfathers could carry out something so vile and heinous. Maybe it's just too horrible of a pill to swallow. The Turks don't deny that the slaughter of roughly, you know, 1.5 million Armenians happened. They just want to blame it on the overall chaos of World War I. And I will carefully illustrate today how that is simply not even close to the truth. Ample evidence to illustrate the, system, the systemic and mass killing of Armenians was planned and administered by the Turkish government. Uh, the U.S. ambassador in Constantinople, a city now known as Istanbul, Henry Morgenthau Sr., who was there, who witnessed the events of the genocide unfold, used a term of his own creation that means the same thing as genocide, used it at the time. Morgenthau was a German-born Jew who had come to the U.S. as a 10-year-old boy, but appointed in... Um, yeah appointed ambassador uh, to the Ottoman Empire by President Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson in 1913. I'm getting so excited about this stuff. I'm fumbling my words more than normal. In his urgent reports to the State Department, he described the systemic slaughter of Armenians as nothing short of, quote, race murder. So he called it at the time race murder. So, you know, genocide. He was very aware that Armenian people were being subjected to deportation, uh, expropriation, abduction, rape, torture, massacre, widespread starvation. And he said so. He said so at the time. He urged Turkish government officials to stop the madness time and time again, reported to his superiors in Washington, D.C. over and over again what was going on to no avail. Uh, we'll follow his quest to get recognition and help for the Armenian community in today's timeline. A big question we need to first answer before we get into the timeline of genocidal events is motive. Got to establish motive for a crime. Why did the Turks do it? What was their motivation to kill the Armenians? This is a, this is a lengthy answer, but I, I think I've summarized it pretty well. Uh, in, in 1906, the most recent year we found comparative figures for, uh, the Ottoman Empire was home to almost 21 million people. That year, the Muslim population composed over 76% of the population. Armenians, around 5%. 
Just over a million Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire in 1906. Why worry about such a small portion of the population? Well, to fully understand that answer, we have to go back almost 14 centuries. One of the world's greatest 20th century tragedies started many, many centuries prior over some cheese. That's right, cheese coming up again. Uh, the Ottomans insisted that everyone in their kingdoms eat only halal cheeses. That is, cheeses made you know, only with rennet from animals slaughtered in their traditional manner prescribed by Islamic law. Rennet is an extract from the fourth stomach of animals, such as young cows and sheep. It's a, a number of en enzymes designed to help digest their mother's milk is in the rennet and these enzymes essential to the cheese making process and Christian Armenian butchers. Well, they were fucked when it came to making this cheese because they couldn't literally kill any animals in accordance with Islamic law because a halal butcher has to be Muslim. And this was very unfortunate because the Armenians were real big uh, fans of chechel cheese, a kind of uh, Armenian mozzarella. It's fucking delicious. And you can't make a proper uh, barak without it, right? I mean, it's fucking, it's fucking cheese turnover. You tell me, how are you supposed to make a cheese turnover without cheese? And the Muslim halal butchers, they weren't going to make it because they didn't give two shits about chechel. And, and this cheese dilemma, well, it snowballed into, um, I'll stop now. Uh, that's nonsense. No, that's crazy talk. The, or the origin of the Armenian genocide doesn't have shit to do with cheese. But I do hope at least one person new to the show was like, what the fuck? And they had to pause and they had to go talk to some people. And they're like, get this, get a load of this. Anyway, uh, back to some reality here. The Ottoman motivation for the Armenian genocide that occurred primarily in 1915 and 1916, but didn't really stop fully until 1923 when the Ottoman Empire finally ceased to exist. And then it actually continued further. Ugh, it'll make sense more in the timeline. It had been building for centuries. The Armenian kingdom of Cilicia was conquered by Ottomans way back in 1375 CE. And prior to that, Christian Armenians had been battling Muslim rulers for several centuries. The Armenian people made their home in the Caucasus region of Eurasia for at least 3,000 years, have made their home there. Today, that region between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea that contains the mighty Caucasus, uh, those mountains, is mainly occupied by Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and parts of southern Russia. And the mountainous kingdom of Armenia has bounced back and forth from being an independent entity and being under the thumb of some foreign ruler so many times during the roughly three millennia of its existence. Much like Poland, Armenia has suffered from being founded in a very unfortunate geographical location, perennially, per perennially uh, stuck in between larger warring empires. At one point, the Armenians were conquered by the Romans, at another by the uh, Byzantine Empire. The Russians have conquered them several times, but no one has conquered and dominated them as long and as often as Muslim rulers have. Those whose kingdoms had risen up you know, from south of Armenia. And Armenians failed to integrate with their Muslim overlords because of their deeply rooted connection to Christianity. In the beginning of the fourth century CE, Armenia became the very first nation in the whole world to make Christianity its official religion. And a few centuries later, this belief system put it at odds with Middle Eastern Muslim invaders coming up from below. Uh, Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, is almost 2,000 miles due north of Mecca, which uh, may not seem, you know... Um, which may seem, excuse me, like a long ways, but it was the closest any Christian nation was to Mecca when Islam was born. Uh, one of the closest. It, early Muslim invaders first reached Armenia way back in 639 CE, just 29 years after the Muslim prophet and founder Muhammad, according to tradition, began receiving his divine revelations. Armenia was the first Christian kingdom to be conquered by a Muslim kingdom. The Muslims conquered a portion of Armenia that same year that they arrived, and Christians and Muslims have been fighting in that area ever since for almost 1,400 years. They have not gotten along for almost as long as it has been possible for Christians and Muslims to not get along. Just six years after making contact in 645 CE, the rest of Armenia fell to the uh, Rashidun Caliphate. And for the following eight centuries, control of the Armenian region shifted from one empire to another. Then, during the 15th century, Armenia was absorbed into the mighty Ottoman Empire, uh, the government that would initiate the Armenian genocide in its final years. The Ottoman rulers, like most of their subjects, were Muslim. And while the Ottomans permitted religious minorities, like the Christian Armenians, to maintain some autonomy, they were allowed to continue to worship, you know, and uh, to carry out their traditions and customs. But, big but, they were also subjugated. Uh, you know, sub subjected... Um, uh, to uh, a number of very unfair laws. They were viewed as infidels, people who didn't belong to the same religion, you know, as, uh, as the kind of overculture, and they were uh, exploited. Uh, the Armenians, other Christians, and Jews had to, for example, pay higher taxes than Muslims. They had very few political and legal rights. Uh, Christians couldn't even be used as witnesses during trials. I mean, think about how fucked up that is as an Armenian Christian. 
and almost all Armenians were Christians. I mean, you could literally uh, witness a Muslim kill your brother or sister and then not be able to testify as a witness at that trial. Did anyone actually see him kill Yusef? I, I did, Your Honor, uh, as did my family uh, and my neighbors. All 27 of us watched the murder unfold right before our very eyes. Interesting. And what's your favorite verse from the Quran? Uh, what? I, I don't know. I don't know, Your Honor. I, uh, I'm Christian. You know what my favorite verse is, Christian? Uh, no, I don't. No, I don't, Your Honor. It's, uh, you subhumans can get the fuck out of my court. I only allow human witnesses. Now go eat shit before I have you killed. It's, you know, that, that kind of vibe. Uh, what rights the Armenians had ebbed and flowed over the centuries? Uh, under what was known as the Ottomans' Devshirme system that was first mentioned in written records in 1438, wasn't, abol uh, wasn't abolished until the early 18th century, Armenians and other non-Muslim minorities were even required to pay a child levy or a blood tax. This shit is ridiculous. Uh, they were required to give roughly 20% of their male children to the state. The kids taken between the ages of 8 and 10 were forced to convert to Islam and become slaves slash soldiers. So, you know, that wasn't very nice uh, way to treat the Armenians. In spite of bullshit like this, in spite of a lot of legal discriminations, in spite of sporadic organized ethnic group killings called pogroms, where Turks occasionally attacked Armenian villages, raping, looting, killing, and destroying property. That went on for centuries. In spite of all this, in the 19th century, in many parts of Turkey, Christian Armenians were still thriving in various communities, thriving more than their neighboring Muslims. And that led to a lot of resentment. This very much paralleled what had been going on between Christians and Jews in much of Christian-dominated Europe for centuries. In Christian-dominated nations, Jews were discriminated against, uh, were despised all the more when they still thrived despite the discrimination. And then in this Muslim-dominated nation, Christians like the Armenians were despised when they still thrived. Then starting in the 1860s, some of the comparatively well-to-do Armenians started asking for, for more civil rights. The fucking nerve! The nerve of these people! wanting to be treated as equals. Excuse me? Uh, the Ottomans did not like that at all. And their government basically told the Armenians to go get fucked. Then when a form of nationalism, including demands for equal rights and a push for autonomy began to spread in the 1870s amongst the Armenian communities of Anatolia, which is what the Turkish peninsula was called within the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman leadership worried that the empire's Islamic character, its, its moral fabric, its very identity and existence were being threatened. How much longer would their Muslim nation continue to be Muslim if Christianity was given the opportunity to spread, to maybe flourish? Then the panic of 1873 hit, a global financial crisis. It greatly weakened the economy of the empire, which led to more instability, more anger, more people pointing fingers, gave more incentive for the Ottomans to find someone to blame for many of their Muslim citizens' economic struggles. Armenians became a, you know, even bigger scapegoat for anything going wrong. Echoes of Nazi Germany here. You know, when Germany economically struggled in the wake of World, I, uh, of, of World War I, excuse me, sanctions, Hitler gave poor, angry German people, the Jews, as a scapegoat to blame for all their troubles. When the Ottomans struggled, the Sultan gave them the Armenians to blame. Same play, just different names for the actors. And it works because people fucking love a scapegoat. That mentality, that's still alive and well today. The Illuminati, the New World Order, the Lizard People, all the QAnon bullshit, those belief systems also fueled in part by scapegoating. It's not your fault. You're not getting, you know, more out of life. It's Illuminati's. They've rigged the game. You can't win. I don't think that explains all the motivation to believe in those kind of conspiracies, but I think it plays a big part. It comes from the same part of the brain. Five years uh, later, after their economy took a beating, in 1878, the Ottomans get the shit kicked out of them by the neighboring Russians in the Russo-Turkish War that lasted until 1879, one of just many Russo-Turkish wars that have been going on for over two centuries. And there have been other wars. The Ottomans have been, had been involved in lots and lots of wars, uh, a lot of them started over tensions between, you know, them and their Christian neighbors. As a result of this last war, Romania, Serbia, Montenegro, they all gained independence from the Ottoman Empire after, you know, Russia gave the Turks that ass whooping. Bulgaria also gained its independence. Bosnia, Her uh, Herzegovina uh, were lost to Austria-Hungary. Cyprus was lost to Britain. And the Armenians, now they wanted to get out too, but they weren't able to. So not able to escape, not able to secede. Uh, they fought to at least be treated equals. You know, and in 1878, Armenian delegates traveled to the Congress of Berlin to lobby Europe's mightiest powers to intervene on their behalf, ensure that they would be treated fairly going forward. And that visit did not sit well with Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who said, quote, well, fuck my ass. Say what? Sweet Muhammad. 
We're gonna have to kill those motherfuckers. Uh, no, he said, uh, such great treachery towards religion and state, may they be cursed upon by God. So he kind of said the same thing. Uh, the Sultan's pride was hurt. Sultan's empire was hemorrhaging territory, a shadow of its former self. This wasn't the first recent war he'd lost. They'd been getting their ass kicked for a while, losing more and more land, losing almost all of it to Christian adversaries. Perfect time for a scapegoat. Why aren't things going well for the Turks? Well, it's the fault of those treacherous Christian Armenians. If they just help out more, fight harder for the Ottomans, stop spiritually weakening their great nation by continually refusing to renounce their faith and adopt Islam, then the Ottoman Empire would be mighty once again. The Sultan declared that he would solve, quote, the Armenian question once and for all. Sounds like a threat. Long held suspicions that the Christian Armenians would be more loyal to Christian governments, such as that of the Russians, who shared an unstable border with Turkey, than they were to the Ottoman Caliphate, had been confirmed now in the Sultan's eyes. He always suspected the Armenians were traitors. This confirmed it. They were stubborn infidels who would have lived or who had lived for too long in the land of Islam. They'd insulted Islam for too long by continually, century after century, refusing to convert. And he just thought, ah, fuck them. In 1890, after continuing tensions and continuing pressure for civil rights reforms for Armenians, the Sultan told a reporter, I will soon settle those Armenians. I will give them a box on the ear, which will make them relinquish their revolutionary ambitions. And then between 1894 and 1896, this box on the ear took the form of what many have called the first Armenian genocide. In response to large-scale protests by Armenians to have the same rights as their neighbors, nothing more, Turkish military officials, soldiers, and ordinary men sacked Armenian villages and cities and massacred their citizens. Hundreds of thousands of Armenians were murdered in what has also been called the Armenian Massacre of 1894 to 1896 and also the Hamidian Massacre. They were killed at the hands of both Ottoman soldiers and non-military Muslim neighbors. Killed at the hands of angry mobs and numerous government-sanctioned attacks. In many instances, their homes were destroyed, sometimes burned to the ground. This led to more deaths as now many homeless Armenians starved or froze to death in the winter of 1895. Wow. Uh, we here in America certainly have uh, many of our own historical dark deeds to uh, account for. You know, plantation slavery, the Trail of Tears, Jim Crow laws, segregation, you know, etc., by the end of the 19th century, at least we weren't butchering a few hundred thousand people for wanting equal rights. Holy shit. Uh, William Sackelbon, or uh, sorry, William Satchelben. There we go. Never seen Satchelben before is the name. Uh, an American journalist who happened to be in uh, Erzurum, a city in northeast Turkey, after a massacre there in 1895, recounted the grisly scene he came across in a lengthy letter to London's daily newspaper, The Times. He wrote, what I myself saw this Friday afternoon, November 1st, is forever engraved on my mind as the most horrible sight a man can see. I went with one of the guards of the English legation, a soldier, my interpreter, and a photographer to the Gregorian Cemetery. Along the wall in the north, in a row 20 foot wide and 150 foot long, lay 321 dead bodies of the massacred Armenians. Many were fearfully mangled and mutilated. I saw one with his face completely smashed in with the blow of some heavy weapon after he was killed. I saw some with their own necks almost severed by a sword cut. One I saw whose whole chest had been skinned, his forearms were cut off, while the upper arm was skinned of flesh. I asked if dogs had done this and was told, no, the Turks did it with their knives. A dozen bodies were half burned. All the corpses had been rifled of all their clothes except a cotton undergarment or two. To be killed in battle by brave men is one thing. To be butchered by cowardly armed soldiers in cold blood and utterly defenseless is another thing. My God, it would have been utterly deplorable if they'd kill people, you know, even with like firing squads in this situation. But this, what, what the fuck even is this? Such savage butchery. No wonder the Turkish government doesn't want to confess to it. Perhaps the most disturbing single tragedy of the first series of attacks on the Armenians took place in the city of Urfa when Ottoman troops burned an American cathedral, or sorry, an Armenian cathedral, in which 3,000 Armenians had taken refuge, men, women, and children the young, the elderly, the healthy, the sick, and they fucking set them on fire and then shot dead anyone who tried to escape. Burned them alive, skinned them, bashing their heads, left their bodies to rot in the streets, right? That'll teach them to want to be treated as equals. How crazy is all this shit? And how crazy is that I'm guessing you, most of you listening have probably never heard of any of it. I hadn't. No one I talked to had, had heard of any of this. Uh, the horrors I've laid out so far, also just the buildup towards today's topic, just the bloody prelude. 
The Ottomans have been fucking over the Armenians ever since they first conquered them well over a thousand years before the genocide. From the very beginning, anyone who wasn't Muslim was treated as a second-class citizen. That was just status quo. Uh, for centuries, many of their children were stolen, forced to join the Ottoman army as slaves. They were taxed more than their Muslim neighbors. They were denied the same rights. Violence against them was routinely ignored. Then as the Ottoman Empire began to crumble, as land was lost, not just in the Russo-Turkish War, but in other skirmishes I haven't mentioned, as some economic troubles swept across the land, the Armenians were treated worse than ever before. As more and more people across the world fought for equal rights late in the 19th century, their Armenians were punished as much as someone can be punished, as much as a group of people can be punished. Soldiers were sent into villages to rape, pillage, murder, neighbors encouraged to join in explicitly, churches, businesses, homes burnt to the ground. I'm not exaggerating. Then after World War I broke out in 1914, the Ottomans feared that their shrinking empire was about to collapse. And it was about to collapse. They worried that the Russians would kick the shit out of them again, and the Russians would. And as the Russians and others began to kick the shit out of them, they worried that the Armenians would rise up in revolt, try to help the Russians and other Christian nations at odds with the Ottomans, and that actually did not happen in most parts of Turkey. There were some revolts, of course, uh, to be sure, but most Armenian citizens did not revolt when World War I broke out. I'm, guess I'm guessing based on the history of dealing with the Turks, they were too afraid. But just in case they might start, the Ottomans thought that they should try and eradicate the people they'd already beaten, subjugated, killed for years, you know, just in case. That was truly their rationale. They thought, especially after getting their asses kicked again in the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913, when they lost even more territory, almost everything they had left in Europe. And I'm speculating here, but somewhat, but not entirely. I think some of them just thought, ah, oh, fuck it. The roof is already on fire. Uh, you know, we don't need no water. Let this motherfucker burn. We're gonna go down. Let's at least try and take the Armenians with us. The people we've despised for centuries. Dark days in Turkey during World War I, real dark days for the Armenians. Uh, other Ottomans did think that they still had a chance to survive the war, despite being heavily outnumbered, outgunned by the Russians, also by the Russian allies of Britain and France, later the U.S. and others. And those who thought they had a chance of surviving seemed to think that chance would be increased by killing the um, Armenian infidels. All right, now before I dig in today's, into today's detailed timeline on the topic, let me give a little overview of the genocide we will be covering. The second Armenian genocide, generally just referred to as the Armenian Genocide. Uh, referred to by Turkey as, you know, just some shit that happened. Uh, it'll help us not get too lost in the force of upcoming information once we're amongst the trees. The, over the overwhelming majority of the atrocities committed against the Armenians, collectively known as the Armenian Genocide, took place from 1915 to 1918, when the bulk of the Armenian population was forcibly removed from present-day Armenia and Anatolia, the big peninsula part of Turkey that, you know, that makes up most of that nation today, to present-day Syria, uh, then uh, another part of, of the Ottoman Empire where the vast majority would be sent into the desert to concentration camps called the Dirazor camps, where they would then die of thirst or hunger or violently at the hands of sadistic guards. Uh, these camps, by the way, uh, not quite like Nazi concentration camps. They really weren't camps at all. They were just large open fields, uh, sometimes fenced off, uh, you know, this, these fields of desert where Armenians were just forced to stay to stay and, you know, they just hoped that they would die. They were treated like cattle, except instead of being herded and moved towards a fresh pasture, they were moved to a desert pasture. No water, no food to eat. According to Minority Rights Group, an international human rights organization, those who survived the long journey south were herded into huge open air concentration camps, the grimmest of which was that, uh, oh, how do I say it again? The uh, Dirazor, where they were starved and killed by sadistic guards. Large numbers of Armenians not sent on death marches to the desert were methodically massacred throughout the Ottoman Empire. Their villages destroyed, their churches burned, you know, beaten, raped, murdered, just as they'd been so many times before. The decision to again answer the Armenian question wasn't something that just happened during the chaos of World War I. Uh, the decision to wipe out the Armenian people was made by the political party in power in the Ottoman Empire, the new Committee of Union and Progress, the CUP, more commonly known as the Young Turks. And yes, if that rings a bell, there is a YouTube channel. It's been around for a long time. It goes by the name of the Young Turks and them having that name is pretty fucked up. Uh, Alex Galitsky, who works for the Armenian National Committee of America stated, quote, if a group decided to call themselves the Young Nazis and pitch themselves as a disruptor or anti-establishment news outlet, people would be rightly outraged. And Alex is right. Why they won't change their name is beyond me. And I think you'll uh, think the same thing. 
uh, by the end of today's episode. If you don't already, I mean, you'll come to understand, hopefully, that calling themselves the Young Turks really is on par with calling themselves the Young Nazis. Uh, the Young Turks were leaders of a reform movement within the Ottoman Empire that sought to replace an absolute monarchy with a constitutional government. And just like the sultans before them, the Young Turks despised the Armenians. They despised non-Muslims. Uh, they were, you know, in a word, the fucking worst. Oh, all right, in three words. Uh, Greeks and Assyrians within the Ottoman Empire would also suffer mightily at their hands. Between, 19 and, between 1914 and 1922, there are academic estimates of a Greek death toll ranging from 289,000 to 750,000 in Anatolia. Why also kill the Greeks? Because just like the Armenians, they were Christians. They were seen as infidels. They too had been dehumanized in the eyes of many Ottoman Muslims for centuries. So, uh, simultaneously, the Assyrian genocide was being carried out. This event sometimes referred to as Sefo, meaning the sword. Between 1914 and 1924, contemporary newspapers reported Assyrian death tolls of 200,000 to 250,000. Why also kill them? I bet you can guess because of uh, cheese. No, because of, uh, you know, uh, they were also Christian. Christians living in the Ottoman Empire. So really the Armenian Genocide was one of three being carried out. And many scholars see these three events as a singular event. I do as well. And, and there were other groups being targeted. This is, It's so fucking crazy how big this can unravel. Uh, like the Kurds. I'll mention them a bit later. The Young Turks motherfuck so many different people. It's distracting to the narrative to try and track all of it. That's how bad they were. The Armenian Genocide is part of a larger anti-Christian genocide where roughly 2,250,000 people considered infidels were butchered by their Muslim rulers, right? After previous Muslim rulers had butchered hundreds of thousands, uh, actually, according to some accounts, several million others. It's, it's, it's fucking crazy. And I'd literally never heard about the massacre of all these people before. Uh, the only thing that seems to have kept this massacre from being smaller in size than the Holocaust is the fact that the Ottomans just were losing territory instead of gaining it. Had they had a military machine similar to the Nazis, had they possessed more territory or a larger population uh, of Christians within their you know, territory, I have no doubt that the death toll would have been much, much, much higher. The Young Turks, every bit as bad as Hitler and his fellow fuckheads. Like the Nazis, the Young Turks even used a secret paramilitary intelligence organization called the Special Organization to plan their systematic destruction of Armenians and others, very similar to Hitler's SS. And the violence didn't totally stop in 1918 when, the, when World War I did. It didn't stop when the Young Turks surrendered. More massacres, expulsions, further mistreatment of Armenians continued all the way to 1923. And whenever I say Armenians going forward, you can almost always just add Greek and Assyrian as well. Uh, further atrocities were carried out by the Turkish nationalists who represented a new political movement opposed to the Young Turks, but who shared a common ideology of ethnic exclusivity. The Ottomans, the Young Turks, the Turkish nationalists, different names, same shit. What was the rest of the world doing about all these atrocities? Let's talk about the international response to the genocide. Uh, the international community did respond, at least verbally and in writing. In May of 1915, Great Britain, France, and Russia advised the young Turks uh, that they would be held personally responsible for these crimes against humanity. They were like, not cool, you guys. We don't like it. We don't approve. We do not approve officially of the slaughter of defenseless and innocent men, women, and children. For the record, we think it's all pretty poopy here. And the Young Turks were like, uh-huh. So uh, when are you guys coming over to suck our dicks? And France, Britain, and Russia were like, what? Never. Why, why did you say that? We're not coming over to do that. We're telling you to, we don't like what you're doing, you know, with the genocide stuff. So please stop it now. And then the Young Turks were like, so like 9 p.m. then? Right before we go to bed? That's, that's good. We'll have our dicks ready. We appreciate, we appreciate you offering to suck them. And then France, Britain, and Russia were like, stop saying that. No, we're not talking about dicks. We never made that offer. And then the Young Turks were like, yeah, but you want to, don't you? I mean, you wouldn't keep talking about it if you didn't want to a little bit, would you? And of course, that exchange didn't happen. But that pretty much uh, was their general sentiment. They didn't give a shit what the international community thought about what they were doing. They still don't. They kind of had this attitude of like, well, those Christians, you know, uh, you know, complaining about what we're doing here, they can also go get fucked. I wish we could kill them all. There was a strong public outcry in the U.S. against the mistreatment of the Armenians. Many private charities did help raise money for them, but no one, not America, Britain, France, Russia, not anyone else upset by what was going on. None of them actually took any strong actions against the Ottoman Empire, either to sanction their brutal policies or to salvage the Armenian people from the grip of extermination. Then later, no real steps were taken to require the post-war Turkish governments to make restitution to the Armenian people for their immense material and human losses. How could this happen? We'll address that more in the timeline, but the short answer is uh, most of the rest of the world was busy dealing with other shit, uh, you know, like World War I. Okay, now we're almost ready for an eye-opening and harrowing timeline. It should be noted that dates in the timeline are given uh, according to the Western calendar, 
Uh, there was a calendar discrepancy because of the calendar that the Ottomans were using that was not the Western calendar. Uh, Going to kick off our timeline shortly after the Ottoman Empire suffered a crushing defeat in the First Balkan War. Looking for someone to blame. The CUP, a.k.a. the Young Turks, accused Christians living in the Ottoman Empire of treachery and treason, causing more national contempt towards Christians in general. As if they fucking needed any more of that. Also, the loss of land in the war resulted in the migration of hundreds of thousands of Muslim refugees into eastern Anatolia compounding the conflict between Muslims and Christians over land. Now let's get into what may come across as a very step-by-step -step guide to committing genocide in today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. Nineteen thirteen, taking advantage of the political confusion reigning in the aftermath of the First Balkan War, which the Ottoman Empire lost in 1912 to some of its former subject states, the Young Turks seized power in a coup in January of 1913. Its members come to be known as Itihadists or Unionists, the three most uh, the three most powerful leaders. The the you know the the three leaders. I don't know. I'm acting like the, the there was a, more than three leaders. Uh, Ismail Enver Pasha, Talat Pasha, and Ahmed. Ahmed Jamal Pasha, who formed a governing triumvirate known as the Three Pashas. They were kind of like the Three Stooges, except uh, instead of masters of slapstick comedy, they were evil murdering races. Uh, fuck these guys. If hell is real, I hope all three are burning there. Uh, Pasha, by the way, not a birth name, more of an Ottoman honorary title, similar to being like a knight in Britain. A lot of Pashas in this story. Just about all of them are shitheads. A uh, young military hero who married into the Ottoman Ottoman dynasty, Enver provided the most public face of the Young Turks as the minister of war. The forces under the command of his brother, Nuri, and uncle Halil had spread devastation through Russian Armenia and carried out many massacres of the Armenians already. When he came into power, uh, the Armenians in the empire were definitely not like, fuck yeah! Ha <laughs> ha! We love Enver! Oh, this bodes very well for us! Uh, Talat was the minister of the interior in Istanbul, or Constantinople, who ran the government for a figurehead grand vizier. Um, he was the mastermind of the Armenian genocide and coordinated the various agencies of the Ottoman government required for the deportation, expropriation, and extermination of the Armenians. Most Armenians probably didn't know who the hell this dude was before he took office. But once he did, uh, he made it real clear. He hated Armenians and wanted them dead. And he became arguably the most hated of all the Pashas. Uh, Jamal, the minister of the Navy, controlled the southern part of the Ottoman Empire, a commander of Syria. The concentration camps and extermination sites fell within his jurisdiction. Uh, interestingly, when the Young Turks first took over, this guy tried to defend the Armenians, uh, but not for long. He caved to the wishes of the other two Pashas, uh, caved to the will of many people in the Ottoman Empire. And together, these three Young Turks, uh, these bigwigs, uh, they brought parliament under their control, tried to push past the loss of the first Balkan war by promoting something known as pan-Turkism. Pan-Turkism, sadly, not delicious. Has nothing to do with that sweet bird meat. Nothing to do with tender sliced breast meat that's been baked and basted in a pan of some kind. Nothing to do with gravy or mashed potatoes. Not associated with cranberry sauce or black olives or stovetop stuffing, which I like more than anything made from scratch because no one in my family tree possesses any culinary sophistication. No. It's not fun. Pan-Turkism is an incredibly racist, xenophobic, nationalistic ideology that has led to millions of non-Turks being butchered and millions more just being subjugated and you know mistreated. The goal of the political movement of Pan-Turkism was the political union of all Turkish-speaking peoples in the Ottoman Empire, Russia, China, Iran, and Afghanistan. The movement initially sought to unite the Turks of the Ottoman and Russian empires against the growing Russian czarist domination. Basically, the young Turks wanted to unite Turkish-speaking Muslims against what they saw as the growing threat of the Christian empires that practically surrounded them. It was a very nationalistic movement, very much a we're number one, fuck everyone else, you know, kind of thing. Uh, nationalism, always scary, always ignorant. Wherever it happens, you know, including America, the us versus them attitude tends to lead to the us doing a lot of real heinous shit to the them you know, men, women, and children uh, far too often. Very primitive, very binary kind of shitty way to think. Us, oh, good, them, bad. You know, it's real life, not a fucking football game. Okay to root for more than one team. 1913 also marks the year that Henry Morgenthau Sr. arrives in the Ottoman Empire. He plays a very interesting role in all of this. His backstory is worth getting into. Morgenthau was born the ninth of 11th living children in Mannheim, Grand Duchy of Baden in 1856 into a Jewish family. He was a, uh, his father, excuse me, was a successful cigar manufacturer. The Morgenthau family immigrated to New York in 1866. 
Henry attended City College in New York, later graduated from Columbia Law School in New York. He purchased some real estate, made a substantial fortune. Also a leader of the Reformed Jewish community there. Morgenthau's career enabled him to contribute handsomely to President Woodrow Wilson's election campaign in 1912. And when Wilson was elected president, Morgenthau assumed that Wilson would appoint him to a cabinet-level position, and then that did not happen. Like other prominent Jewish Americans before him, Morgenthau was appointed as ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. Wilson assumed that Jews were the natural bridge between Muslim Turks and the Christians, including the Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire. Morgenthau wasn't exactly pumped, but Wilson assured him that Constantinople was, quote, the point at which the interest of American Jews in the welfare in the welfare of the Jews of Palestine, Palestine is focused. My God, I'm going to restart that quote. <laughs> what do I had trouble with that uh, pronunciation? Uh, he said that, that Constantinople was the point at which the interest of American Jews in the welfare of the Jews of Palestine is focused, and it is almost indispensable that I have a Jew in that post. So interesting how much times and language have changed. I always think like I tend to speak in like rhythms and sometimes old timey language, just the rhythm of the way they wrote things throws me off. And also just like how casually they throw around these terms. Totally okay, apparently, for the president of the U.S. in 1913 to say, quote, you know, I need to, I have to have a Jew in that post. <laughs> Not okay now. Because I, I, I imagine everyone around him back then was just like, yeah, sounds great, Mr. President. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely uh, would be good to put a Jew in that post. Can't, can't not have a Jew in Turkey. Imagine if Biden said something like that now. Kamala, uh, I need a Jew in that post. Find me a Jew. I have some other posts I'll need a few blacks and some Orientals for. Uh, any suggestions? <laughs> Ridiculous, just the language. Uh, Morgenthau initially rejected the offer, but after a trip to Europe, after he saw some things that concerned him greatly, he changed his mind. I think you're going to like Morgenthau. He, was, he, he really tried. He was a good dude. He really, really tried to stop it. But one man just can't stop a regime. On November 30th, 1913, the special organization, the name for the secret fighting force, you know, used by the Young Turks, their SS, uh, is officially formed. Originally created uh, to organize violence in Western Thrace, a Greek territory lost during the First Balkan War. This group will play a key role in the Armenian Genocide. On February 21st, 1914, the Young Turks start a boycott of Armenian businesses. So it begins. Here we go. Uh, the Nazis would later do this with the Jews in Germany. Five days later, on February 26th, a police spy notifies Rashad Bey, chief of the political section of the Constantinople Police Department, that he is providing the names, biographies, pictures, and speeches about reform, as well as other data of 2,000 Armenian political thinkers and leaders that they feel like they may have to deal with, right? Going after the intellectuals now. They'll be amongst the first to die. The next week on March 2nd, parliamentary elections are held in Turkey. Only candidates approved by the Young Turks will win seats. Guess who does not get to be a candidate? Ding, ding, ding. That's right. Anyone who's Armenian. Nope, don't even uh, get to be a candidate. On July 28th, uh, negotiations between the Turkish and German imperial governments go down. They make their little uh, little uh, truce of sorts for World War One. On August 1st, Germany fighting for Austria-Hungary declares war on Russia, fighting for Serbia, kicking off World War One. And the Ottoman Empire, friendly with Germany, uh, not friendly with Russia. Uh, while they don't join the fighting quite yet, uh, they will soon join Germany in attacking Russia. When the war begins, Armenians are divided with some fighting on the side of the Ottoman Empire, some for Russia, uh, due to many Armenians living in Russian territory at the time. And fear that more Armenians will also fight for Russia will throw fuel into the existing fire of how best to answer the Armenian question. On August 8th, censorship of all telegraphic communication is announced by the Turkish government, justified as a wartime measure, right? Cut off communications to the outside world, perfect way to try and hide a genocide. On August 18th, Government-sponsored looting is reported in several provinces. The government justifies the looting by saying that those involved are just collecting contributions to the war effort. Stores owned by Armenian and Greek merchants are vandalized, with over a thousand shops owned by Armenians alone burned in the city of just uh, Diyarbakir. Forty years after uh, 25,000 Armenians and Assyrians were killed in the first Armenian genocide, now over a thousand businesses are destroyed in this city. Uh, no but Muslim businesses are destroyed. I guess they didn't have any contributions that needed to be collected for the war effort. What a friendly way to describe just taking people's shit and then fucking destroying what they didn't want to take. Calm down, sir. Calm down. Okay? Those are hefty accusations you're throwing around. Those men didn't just break into your store and steal all of your inventory and then burn down the rest of your store. No, they were collecting contributions. Come on, how dare you? It was done for the war effort. 
right? And then the burning thing, that was just, you know, they were, just, they were blowing off some steam and they were just making sure that the enemies didn't get some things maybe they didn't, you know, think about getting. And, and hey, and, and they didn't just rape your daughter and beat your son half to death. Thank you very much either. They were, uh, uh, they were educating your family on the importance of putting the needs of the empire above all else, you selfish Armenian. It's fucking ridiculous. On August 28th, 1914, in the city of Sivas, 56,000 soldiers of the 10th Army Corps are quartered in and around Christian districts, beefing up supervision of Armenians as well as Greek and other Christian minorities, you know, the Syrians, etc. On August 30th, local Armenian militia members in Zaytun defend locals from Turkish attacks. And then they are, of course, immediately painted as the aggressors. How, how dare they defend themselves? Look at those aggressive Armenians shooting back at us. Uh, on September 11th, the Armenian National Assembly, composed of civil and religious representatives, meet in Constantinople and, in, and they advise Armenians in the provinces to remain calm in the face of provocation. Highly doubt anyone walked away from that meeting feeling real calm, uh, based on what had been happening to Armenians for centuries. You know, a bunch of looting has been going on now. And, you know, a bunch of soldiers have gathered outside a lot of our villages. You know, they've been shooting at us. They burned some stuff. They burned some people. You know, two decades ago, same motherfuckers, you know, with the different names, killed a couple hundred thousand of us, but nothing to freak out about, right? <laughs> right? I mean, we should, we should be calm. Can't imagine. On September 27th, news reaches Constantinople about the Turkish government's new demand that the Armenian population in Zaytun turn over all its weapons, even including knives. That same demand will soon follow in more cities. Nothing to get worked up about. Uh, they're just taking all of our guns and knives. <laughs> it's fine. There's nothing bad will happen after this. Oh, my God. Uh, thank God this shit would not play out very well in the U.S. right now, you know? Uh, reading this makes me want to carve out some, some time to buy some more ammo, head to the local gun range. Uh, three days later, on September 30th, the government distributes arms to some Muslim residents, saying the nearby Armenian population is unreliable. And that, of course, is straight up fucking terrifying if you're Armenian, right? They've taken your weapons. And, you know, days later, they give weapons to a rival cultural group, many of whom hate your fucking guts and tell them to keep a close eye on you. Tense times. Time to pack up your shit and start a new life somewhere, anywhere else, if you're Armenian. Uh, traveling, not so easy back then, though. And to be fair to the Armenians, you know, uh, many would try to make it out and many would be sent back from neighboring countries back into the genocide, back to the Ottoman Empire. On October 1st, the government orders the closure of all foreign postal services now in Turkey. Aha, well, I guess in the Ottoman Empire. Sorry. Sometimes I, the names keep changing. Uh, cutting off more communication, right? Hide that genocide. The same day, uh, Nazaret Chavish, the most notable Armenian leader in Zaytun, murdered on the order of the local governor, the first political assassination of the genocide. Meanwhile, more looting under the guise of war contributions occurs in random villages. On the 10th, back in Zaytun, all the Armenian community leaders are called to a meeting. About 60 show up and all are immediately arrested. Not alarming at all. Nothing to see here. On October 13th, the Armenians in Constantinople get the news that the looting of Armenian businesses under the guise of war contributions has now occurred in every province. The chaos is really just beginning. On October 13th, more bad news makes it to Constantinople because of the desperate conditions created by the war contributions campaign. The Sivas province is now beset by disease or beset with uh, disease and starvation. Uh, weirdly, the starvation doesn't seem to affect local Muslims there who for some reason didn't uh, have all their shit looted and burned. On October 17th, the 11th Battalion of Turkish soldiers, a battalion made up of largely violent ex-cons, not making that detail up, began not only looting, but also assaulting women and children, uh, just straight up butchering Armenians in the Erzurum province. This killing squad would become known as the Butcher Battalion and would carry out, as one officer put it, the liquidation of Christian elements. This killing squad and others like it, they drowned people in rivers, uh, threw people off cliffs, crucified them, burned them alive. In short order, the Turkish countryside was littered with Armenian corpses. An eyewitness to the horror later recalled, I witnessed numerous ghastly scenes, women and children lying here and there in the valleys, either killed or dead from exhaustion. Another remembered women being separated from their children. When our mother came for the last time and kissed us madly, I remember she was clad only in her white underwear. There were no ornaments, no gold, no velvet clothes. We, the children, were unaware of the events happening. In reality, they had taken off their clothes, one after the other, had arranged the garments on one side, had stripped the women completely, had cut their heads off with axes and thrown them into the valley. Like, they're not just killing these people. They're fucking butchering them with so much hate, so much anger, torturing them, cutting their heads off. It's just barbaric shit. 
Also on October 17th, the Armenian political leaders, uh, um, or excuse me, more Armenian political leaders are arrested. On October 22nd, Enver Pasha authorizes a combined German-Turkish naval force now to carry out a stealth attack on Russia, even though the Ottoman Empire hadn't officially entered the war yet. Russia replied by declaring war on November 1st, 1914, and Russia's allies, Britain and France, also declare war on the Ottoman Empire on November 5th. So now they're officially in the war. On November 13th, unfounded accusations are launched by the Ottoman government that some Armenians have been revolting and preparing to join the Russian forces. They tried that uh, true shady regime tactic here. Tried and true. Hope to prevent international outcry by claiming unprovoked attack? What? Butchering innocent unarmed people? No way! We're quelling insurrections! Had to be done. You see the way that one guy looked at me? He was trying to start some shit. That's, that we had to burn his fucking house down and kill his family. On November 21st, young, Turks, uh, young Turk agents in the Mush province distribute arms to the Muslims and also spread false stories of Armenian outrages, right? Just fueling that propaganda. Get that machine going. Uh, on November 23rd, previously undisturbed Armenian schools and churches in Sivas in that province, together with many private residences, are requisitioned by the Turkish army to be used as barracks. The army also confiscates the Armenian villagers' carts, horses, and other travel equipment. Uh, they don't pay them for any of this. They just, they just take their shit. Uh, anyone who has their house taken, you know, oh, well, well, good luck. Good luck living. You know, your, their horse is taken. Any means, you know, every, everything taken. All their money. The kids can't go to school. Everything's taken from them. Just, oh, well. Uh, the war ministry led by Enver distributes explosives, rifles, and other special or, and other equipment to the special organization on November 26th. The Young Turks SS now heavily armed. Uh, the same day, Enver's uncle, Halil Pasha, the military governor of Constantinople, begins organizing special organization units in Constantinople by enrolling criminals released from prison. Three days later, these forces invade the region of Van and rob and loot Armenian business. Like, they're literally just getting people out of prison and just being like, hey, man, just go fuck up uh, that province over there. Just do what you want. Just do whatever you want. Uh, the government supplies it with money, vehicles, and other equipment. Reports continue reaching Constantinople about other raids on Armenian villages and provinces across the empire. Fucking what? Imagine this all happening now. The government hires a bunch of violent convicts to just go destroy your town. Imagine the anarchy. Doors getting kicked in. Rape and murder occurring in front of victims' families. Uh, occurring literally out in the streets. On December 6th, Armenians are put to use as porters of army supplies in several provinces. Freezing conditions, a lack of sufficient food will soon lead to many of their deaths. So they just work them to death to help the military effort. On December 23rd, foreign missionaries abandon the interior of Turkey as religious crosses on the missions are broken by roving bands replaced by crescents, the symbol of Turkish national identity. Uh, December 31st, Sahag Obadashian, a newly appointed Armenian prelate, a.k.a. bishop, is slain in the village of Khanli Tash by six butchers organized by Ahmed Mumar, the governor general of Sivas. Uh, Abadashian had previously been in charge of the city's National Armenian School, also taught Armenian language, Armenian history, and religion. So now erasing Armenian culture, right? Destroy their teachers. Reminds me of Cambodia's Khmer Rouge. On January 5th, 1915, the Ottoman government publicly charges that Armenian bakers in the army bakeries of Sivas have been poisoning the bread of the Turkish forces, trying to kill them by poison. The bakers are cruelly beaten. Some die, despite the fact that a group of doctors proved the charge to be false by examining the bread. The Muslim doctors even eat it. And they're like, no, this is fine. The government doesn't give a fuck. They don't rescind the charge. Violence and paranoia leading to more violence and paranoia. On January 12th, Ahmed Muar, the governor general of Sivas, uh, orders the destruction of Tavrakoy and other strategically located villages around the city of Sivas in order to make future defenses impossible for Armenians, right? Just, just completely just destroy some villages. Inside the city of Sivas, strategically located buildings are appropriated, you know, just taken from Armenians. Uh, meanwhile, on the World War I front, things at least not going well for the Turkish army. So that feels good in the story. At the Battle of Sarakamish, the army loses 70,000 men out of 85,000 total men. And after reading all these other stories, I got to just kind of think, fuck them. I mean, some of them, you know, I'm sure weren't down with this, but it feels like from everything I've read that a lot of them were. So of all the ones who were okay with the Armenian stuff, well, fuck them. After the defeat at the hands of the Russians, the young Turks uh, blame Armenian soldiers somehow for the loss, right? If they weren't so busy just being distracted, taking all the Armenian shit, they could focus more on the war, could have won if it wasn't for those fucking scapegoats. Uh, later that January, in remarks reported by the New York Times, Talat Pasha, Minister of the Interior, right, one of those thir three stooges, 
Uh, he said there was no room for Christians in Turkey and that their supporters should advise them to clear out. That's fun to read if you're Armenian. Uh, honey, uh, we, we might want to grab the kids and get to getting out right now. The writing isn't literally on the wall, but it is literally in the New York Times. Uh, meanwhile, Morgenthau, that U.S. ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, getting extremely troubling reports about what's going on around the Ottoman Empire from his 10 American consuls posted throughout the country. However, Morgenthau believes what Talat is telling him, that the violence is random. It's random wartime violence, not sanctioned by the government. It will soon be contained, put to a stop. Morgenthau had heard that the violence was government sanctioned, but the Turkish government was making it impossible for him to fact check or verify anything. They were shutting down his communication. Uh, on February 2nd, Talat advises German ambassador Count Hans von Wagenheim that the war is the favorable moment to conclude the Armenian question. Clearly, violence is not random. This dude might as well have just gone on record saying something like, we want to fucking kill all of them. How, how much more clear can I make it? We fucking hate all of them. All this evidence, Turkish government still denies a genocide ever occurred to this day. On February 14th, Tahir Jevdet, the governor general of the Van province, is reported as saying that the government must begin finishing off the Armenians in the city of Van, a major urban area, at once. On February 9th, Talat and other young Turk leaders uh, decide in a meeting that should Allied naval ships breach the Dardanelles Strait on their way to the Sea of Marmara, the Turks should burn Constantinople before retreating and slaughter all the city's Christian inhabitants. Fuck. Just because they hated them. You know, even, even in a law situation, if they have to surrender, hey, before you get out, if the Allies are coming, just make sure you kill all the Armenians. On March 3rd, a dispatch from the Young Turks Central Committee is released announcing an official decision to exterminate Armenians. Uh, the killing will ramp up substantially now. On March 9th, Ottoman army units attack Zaytun. Armenian community leaders and intellectuals are tortured and killed. Six Tur Turkish military police officers are killed by individuals resisting the attack, galvanizing the Turkish forces further, and three days later, massacres and robberies are carried out. On March 13th, a traveling commission of parliamentary deputies begins touring the cities of Anatolia, stopping to address crowds in the mosques, where they describe Armenians as internal en enemies who must be destroyed. How scary is that if you're Armenian? Government officials showing up at church, you know, stepping up and just like, hey, we, we got to kill these people. We have to get rid of them. On March 19th, six Armenian soldiers from the town of Guran are publicly hanged in Sivas to frighten the Armenian population into submission. On March 29th, in Aleppo, Jamal Pasha, minister of the Navy, announces that the Armenians of Zaytun are in revolt. Uh, yeah, I bet, I bet they were. Of course. They were defending themselves. Uh, he instructs the military authorities to take measures to punish the Armenians, if they're not being punished enough already. Two days later, on March 31st, the deportation to the desert concentration camps begins in Zaytun. Some of the Armenians are sent to the Konya Desert in central Anatolia. The rest are sent to the Deir el-Zor camps in the Syrian desert that I mentioned earlier. And again, they weren't really camps. They're just sent to large patches of desert where many of them will, you know, dehydrate and die, starve and die, you, just, you know, you name it. Also that day, Azadomat, the leading Armenian newspaper in Constantinople, is closed by an order of the government. The editors will be executed the following June. Rolling in the background of this timeline now for the next, you know, uh, well, next three years forward, and more than that, actually, pretty much weekly skirmishes. Uh, there have already been numerous other atrocities committed that I haven't mentioned. There's just too many incidents. I won't be mentioning anywhere near all of them, but know that they're happening. Crazy, again, there's so much horror committed in the Ottoman Empire that it's just, it's just will become tedious to list it all out. It would be overkill, overkill. An attack on this village here, a mass arrest there, burning, raping, looting, killing, wash, rinse, repeat, day after day, month after month, year after year. On April 8th, the famous monastery of, in Zaytun is burned down by the Turks, or a famous monastery. The Turkish government interferes with American ambassador Henry Morgenthau's ability to communicate with his American consuls, uh, you know, still. They, they're still continuing to hide, hide, hide. On April 15th, Armenian refugees from villages surrounding the city of Van arrive and notify the Constantinople Armenians that 80 villages in the Van province have been obliterated and that 24,000 Armenians have already been killed uh, in just the past three days. An estimated 32,000 more will be killed by the end of April over the next two weeks. On April 17th, some Armenian inhabitants of Van organize themselves into a defensive force. They successfully defend themselves until advanced units of the Russian army consisting of Armenian volunteers arrive to their rescue on March, um, excuse me, on May 23rd, 1915. Thank God, the rare piece of good Armenian news in this timeline. Timeline. Some people fought off the Turks and got out and were rescued. Good on Russia. 
after being the villain in so many sucks, I got to say, I love how Russia is the good guy in this episode. One of the good guys. Uh, they kick the shit out of the Turks over and over in this suck. And I love it. I wish someone was kicking the shit out of the Turkish government right now. Uh, on April 20th, the government finishes the deportation of 25,000 Armenians from Zaytun. Late on April 24th, the day the Allies begin to invade parts of Turkey, 250, or 250 Armenian intellectuals and community leaders are arrested in Constantinople. Even though so much has already happened, this is the date, this uh, April 25th, that will be recognized as the start of the Armenian genocide uh, as recognized by Armenians worldwide on the 100th anniversary uh, on the hundredth anniversary of this date back in 2015. Hard to pin dates uh, on this genocide, exact dates, because it, it just wasn't like the Armenians had been treated really well by the Ottomans previous to this date, uh, previous to World War I or after World War I. Uh, also, before I forget, I'm not saying he had anything to do with any of this horrible shit, but also I do want to say that I don't know where my dad was in 1915. Now, could he have been a young Turk? Over in the Ottoman Empire, just part of all this, uh, you know, horrible stuff, all these all these atrocities. Uh, I mean, you know, I guess technically it's possible. He says he was born in 1954, but I've I've never seen his birth certificate. Uh, I've never seen his driver's license, and there's just a lot I don't know about my dad. You know, is he 66? That's what he says, or is he around 120, maybe 125? I don't know. Probably didn't have anything to do with all this, but I just I just wanted to share that thought, you know, before I forgot. Okay, back to 1915. Now, that's a joke from a previous suck. If you're very confused. It was confusing and that sucked. On April 29th, the Turkish government carries out a mass disarming campaign against the Armenians of Constantinople. On May 2nd, Halil Pasha, Enver's uncle, the military governor of Constantinople, and his forces are defeated by the Russian army in the Caucasus and in northern Iran. Fuck yeah. Go, Russia, go. What is big deal? You root for Russell now. You like, after all, how Russell. Well, we may be good for you to do more than make soft shame cock joke. Chikatilo will sing now you hard from Mother Russia. I didn't expect Chikatilo to show up in the suck when I began working on my notes. Uh, it just kind of happened. Very old time suck reference if you're confused now. What is big deal? You're confused. You may be bothered that I jerks off Shamecock and corner you, even though I truly bother no one. He's gone now. Uh, the defeated Turks retreat to Van, Bitlis, and Mush, where they massacre some Armenians, once again dealing with defeat from an external foe by scapegoating the Armenians. Uh, across the Ottoman Empire, other massacres taking place. Many who aren't being killed are deported, subject to random arrests and house searches. One survivor, Christine uh, Hagopian, described her experience with a house search. She said, We had already been deported once in 1915, sent towards Derzor. But my uncle's friend had connections in the government and he had us ordered back to Izmir. Orders came again that everyone must gather in front of the Armenian church to be deported. My father refused to go, told us not to worry. He didn't think the Turkish government would do anything to him since he was a government employee himself. Twelve Turkish soldiers and an official came very early the next morning. We were still asleep. They dragged us out in our nightgowns and lined us up against the living room wall. Then the official ordered my father to lie down on the ground. They are dirty, the Turks. Very dirty. I can't say what they did to him. They raped him. Raped just like that, right in front of us. And that official made us watch. He whipped us if we turned away. My mother lost consciousness and fell to the floor. Afterwards, we couldn't find our father. My mother looked for him frantically. He was in the attic trying to hang himself. Fortunately, my mother found him before it was too late. My father did eventually kill himself later after we escaped. What the actual fuck? Just spread a little horror by raping dad in front of the family. I'll teach him to disobey a horrible command. Just knocking down some Armenian cultural morale a bit by sexually assaulting some patriarchs. And I say some because I can't imagine this was an isolated incident. Clearly, the young Turks and their goons just did whatever the fuck they wanted to do to the Armenians. Nothing was off limits. They gave in fully to the darkest of their desires. They went total evil. And, and you know what? And I bet many of them went home to their families after incidents like this, had some nice meals, you know, asked uh, how the kids uh, were doing in school, probably said some prayers before going to bed. Meat sacks, for better or worse, man, we can be so good at rationalization and compartmentalization. On May 6th, 1915, the New York Times reports that the Young Turks have adopted a policy to annihilate the Armenians. Word genocide may not exist yet, but clearly the New York Times write an article saying that the, the Young Turks are committing genocide. And it's just the beginning. On May 19th, the advanced troops of the Russian army led by Armenian volunteers reach Van, right, save what's left of the city. That's good. When regular Russian army forces arrive in Van, they begin the cremation of the dead, find that around 55,000 of the total dead are Armenians, just this one city. 
Armenian parliamentary deputy uh, Vartkas visits police commissioner Assam Bedri to protest the arrest of the Constantinople Armenian community leaders on May 21st. Tragically still thinking, praying that the government can be reasoned with. Four days later, Vartkas will be uh, murdered while in police custody. They cannot be reasoned with. On May 22nd, Turkish refugees are settled into the now emptied Armenian villages of the Tortum district of the uh, Erzurum province, just like Hitler's idea of Liebenstrom. Uh, Liebenstrom here giving the land, you know, uh, to those you expel to your own people. On May 24th, Allied powers sent a note to the Turkish cabinet saying that they hold it responsible for the massacres of the Armenians, but the repercussions for their actions not made clear. You know, just more like a, guys, guys, stop it. We don't like it. We don't like it when you rape dads in front of their kids or adopt policies of annihilation towards the Armenians. You young Turks are really, really grinding our gears. Don't make me raise my voice. Don't make me issue you more stern warnings followed by no consequences. Uh, on May 29th, Talat is reported to have said that he was going to give the Armenians a new and final residence. Sounds bad. Guessing that final residence, uh, you, you know, when he said that, he didn't mean beach house. Uh, the same day, 630 Armenians who had been arrested on May 10th in uh, Diyarbakir are murdered in the village of Bashiri while in custody, their bodies just thrown casually into the Tigris River. Uh, in June, official proclamations crop up around the empire like this one. Our Armenian fellow countrymen, because they have attempted to destroy the peace and security of the Ottoman state, have to be sent away to places which have been prepared in the interior. And a literal obedience to the following orders in a categorical in a categorical manner, is accordingly enjoined upon all Ottomans. With the exception of the sick, all Armenians are obliged to leave within five days from the date of this proclamation. Although they are free to carry with them on their journey the article of the articles of their movable property which they desire, they are forbidden to sell their land and their extra effects or to leave them here and there with other people. And again, imagine that, that shit happening now. Imagine the government just says, you got five days to get the fuck out and you can't, you know, sell your property. Uh, you can't give your property to anybody to look after. Just, you know, grab what you can take uh, and with you while you walk and leave. Uh, the first convoy of Armenian deportees leaves uh, Erzinjan towards Kamak. Could not find English pronunciation guides for those bad boys or a lot of these words actually. On their way to the Syrian desert, a slow moving column of about 20,000 people. Sogaman Talarian, then 19, marched with his mother and siblings, two sisters of 15 and 16, another of 26, who carried a two and a half year old child and two brothers of 22 and 26. And their journey was just hell on earth. The military police said to be protecting the convoy first dragged Talarian's sisters off behind the bushes to rape them. Next, he watched a man split his 22 year old brother's head open with an ax. Uh, finally, the soldiers shot his mom and struck Talarian unconscious with a blow to the head. He was left for dead. But then he woke up hours later in a field of corpses, many of the bodies his family members. He spots the mangled body of a sister, the shattered skull of his brother. His other relatives have disappeared. Uh, some of them cannot imagine, cannot imagine what that level of tragedy would feel like to survive it psychologically. I mean, you just have to go numb, go to some place where in a sense you just can't feel emotional pain as intense anymore. We, we will meet this character again, uh, something to look forward to. Talarian, much later in this timeline, will enact some epic vengeance. Uh, let the knowledge that it's coming carry you through a lot of wicked shit coming up. Also, since I think it's more powerful to hear from those it happened to, let me play a bit of testimony given by somebody who was there. Not for this walk, but just during the genocide. This is Hagus Bonaparte, a survivor speaking to what the Turks did to his family. How many of your friends and relatives? Oh, uh, my, they killed two of my sisters, uh, my brothers, uh, four of my uncles. Uh, there was... They arrested 2,500, all of the leading professionals, including all the 10 of the college professors, the businessmen, the pharmacists, the uh, intellectual group, 2,500 in the first group, and they killed not too far away from Mazra. How do you know they killed them? What group do because have? one of the pharmacists uh, being falling down among the corpse after two nights of uh, struggle, he came to American hospital, Dr. Atkins, reporting that they're not deporting it, they're killing him. Wow, my God. Laying amongst the dead for two to three days, crawling to a hospital to survive and bear witness to what had happened. And there are thousands of testimonials like that. That's a small snippet of one of like many, many. I'll mention, talk more about those later in the time or later in the episode. 
June 13th, 1915, the war ministry notifies that the permits given to Armenians exempting some of them from deportations are, are temporary. Instructions concerning procedures for the deportations and urging extreme strictness are sent to provincial governors. That same day, 25,000 Armenians uh, have now been murdered after four days of massacre. It's announced that they've been murdered with the 86th Cavalry Brigade with its officers and the 2nd Reserve Cavalry Division of the Turkish Army participating heavily in the slaughter. According to reports, many of these 25,000 killed by being thrown off a fucking cliff into the Euphrates River. Right? They took thousands and thousands of people, pushed them towards this cliff, and then just pushed them off and let them just die hitting the, you know, the rocks in the river below. This is so insane. Just like uh, going full ancient Mongol going ancient Viking, worse. Like just, it's, ah, rape and pillage, you know, destroyed by any means necessary. On June 17th, 8,500 Armenians withdraw into the ruined castle of Shabin uh, Karashar to defend themselves against the Turks. According to some sources, the Armenians defended themselves against the Turks um, for you know, a couple of days before they ran out of ammunition, completely surrounded, knowing that they were going to die. They tried to run out from the castle ruins, fight with their own bare hands. All were killed. Women, children, the elderly, everyone slaughtered. June 21st, the governor general of Aleppo, uh, Mehmet Jalal Bey, removed from his post because of his protests about the deportation orders and massacres. He had been trying to protect Armenians. Uh, he's been called the Turkish Oscar Schindler. Good reminder that not all the Muslim Turks were okay with what was happening, just like not all Germans were okay with what Hitler and his goons were doing during World War II. Uh, Jalal Bey would survive the war and die in 1926. Some of the interviews he gave following the war are so important in proving this really was a genocide. He said he compared himself to a, uh, a person sitting by the side of a river with absolutely no means of saving anyone. Blood was flowing in the river and thousands of innocent children, irreproachable old people, helpless people, strong young men were streaming down this river towards oblivion. Anyone I could save with my bare hands, I saved, and the others, I think they streamed down the river never to return. On June 25th, 1915, American ambassador Henry Morgenthau, now fully believing the reports he's been getting about the killings, that they're anything but random acts, that they are government-led, tries to reason with Talat Pasha. Conversations like this one will be later included in his memoirs. Morgenthau tried to get Talat to see that the crimes he was committing against the Armenians were wrong. Uh, you know, uh, he, he included pointing out that from an economic standpoint, that it would just, you know, not smart to do this, that there would be severe losses. And when he said this, uh, point out these economic, you know, problems to lots said, we care nothing about commercial loss. We have figured all that out. We know that it will not exceed 5 million pounds. We don't worry about that. I have asked you to come here so as to let you know that our Armenian policy is absolutely fixed and that nothing can change it. We will not have the Armenians anywhere in Anatolia. They can live in the desert, but nowhere else. Morgenthau attempted to persuade Talat that the treatment of the Armenians was destroying Turkey in the eyes of the world. He told him, you are making a terrible mistake. And Talat replied with, yes, we may make mistakes, but we never regret. Morgenthau had had it then. Uh, he pulled out a pistol and shot Talat's dick clean off. Perfect shot, one shot. While Talat screamed out in agony, he danced a little jig around him. Morgenthau did and started saying stuff like, do you regret, you know, telling me you never regret now? Because that shit just got your fucking dick shut off. And then he cut Talat's balls off with a spoon, made him eat them, no spit anything back up, clean plate club. I wish. Now in real life, he just left the room. He was just like, ah, fuck that guy in his head. And he left the room just wishing he was dead. Uh, in Morgenthau's opinion, as he would later write, the more suffering the Armenians endured, the more Talat seemed to despise them, which makes a dark kind of psychological sense, right? He has to rationalize. They deserve all this, doesn't he? To be able to do it with a clean conscience. He has to fully dehumanize them, to treat them like he does. Uh, one day discussing a particular Armenian, Morgenthau told Talat that he was mistaken in regarding this man as an enemy of the Turks, that in reality, he was a friend. And Talat replied, no Armenian can be our friend after what we have done to them. Ugh. Probably true by that point. And, and interesting psychology here, right? Talat knew they had already fucked over the Armenians so horrifically, so unforgivably, that to leave any alive would be to risk retribution and revenge. Uh, July 5th, 1915, the first convoy of deportees leaves from the city of Sebas, march to the desert to die. Every day for 16 days, an average of 400 families will leave the city, uh, with the overwhelming majority being slain en route to the Syrian desert. One survivor, RPR Masakian, would later remember making it to the desert with his family. He'd say, they took us toward Derzor, the interior Syria, Syrian desert. Our whole family, my father, mother, four brothers, two sisters. I was 20. At the time, we loaded everything we had on mules and horses and set out under armed guards. 
They took us to Meshkina on the Euphrates River. Meshkina was a huge outdoor camp where tens of thousands of Armenians had been deported. Bit by bit, they were sent to Dzor to their death. We were there for a while. We lived under tents along with a lot of others from Kassab. Most of the time, we had nothing to eat. Sometimes my father would buy bread from the soldiers, but they had mixed sand with the flour. So we ate this hard bread and sand crunched under our teeth. Mesekha was a, or uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have a pronunciation for this one either. Meskena, there we go, was a horrible, horrible place. 60,000 Armenians had been buried under the sand there. When a sandstorm hit, it would blow away a lot of the sand and uncover those remains. Bones, bones, bones were everywhere then. Wherever you looked, wherever you walked. It feels like the Ottoman Empire was being ran by the moral equivalents of the serial killers we've covered so far in Time Suck. Right? It's as if like the butcher of Kansas City, the truck stop killer, Leonard Lake, Charles Ng, Richard Chase, more of those dirtbags were just, you know, given carte blanche to, to do what they want with, to the Armenians, just to run the camps, to run the fucking, uh, you know, the marches, to whatever, the looting. On July 10th, 1915, Ambassador Morgenthau cables Washington, D.C. with the description of the Turkish campaign of horror against the Armenians. He wrote, President Wilson, stop being such a bitch. Do something. Take your glasses off, put your fucking nuts back on, and get over here. And stop, you know, just not giving a fuck about Armenians, you douche whistle. Uh, he didn't say that. Maybe he should have. Wilson may have been less motivated than most U.S. presidents would have been when it came to helping Armenians. He purportedly once lamented that the contamination of American bloodlines by sordid and hapless elements coming in from Southern and Eastern Europe was troubling him. Coming from right where Armenia was. Eek. Uh, Morgenthau really wrote, persecution of Armenians assuming unprecedented proportions. Reports from widely scattered districts indicate systematic attempt to uproot peaceful Armenian populations and through arbitrary arrests, terrible tortures, wholesale expulsions and deportations from one end of the empire to the other, accompanied by frequent instances of rape, pillage, and murder turning into massacre to bring destruction and destitution on them. These measures are not a response to popular or fanatical demand, but are purely arbitrary and directed from Constantinople in the name of military necessity, often in districts where no military operations are likely to take place. And again, he's just pointing out, like he's making it abundantly clear, it's a genocide. On July 14th, the commander of Aleppo's 4th Army Corps protests to the governor general of Diyarbakir province about the steady stream of dead bodies in the Euphrates River that had, begun flowing, that had been flowing since June 22nd. He advises burial. Another survivor, Bedros Bedorian, would have memories of seeing this river. He recounted, when the massacres began, I was 12 years old. I remember they first took all the men of our village from our village and killed them. The rest of us were deported. I don't know how many hundreds we were, Everyone, according to his ability, rented a donkey or a horse, and we left. We went from Albastan to Zaitun to Marash to Antab. We camped on a farm behind Antab College near some newly dug foundations for houses. They were simply large holes in the ground. An epidemic had broken out in our caravan, and people were dying all around us. They started filling those foundations with dead bodies. Two, three, four, five bodies on top of each other. How disturbing is that? I'm sure there's houses there now that have just all their remains in the foundation. From Antab, orders uh, came that everyone over the age of 12 was to be sent to Deir el-Azor. A friend of mine and I escaped, but we were caught later. And this time they sent us to Bazib, then towards Birjig. Birjig is on the shores of the Euphrates. It is on the other side of the river. We stayed at an inn on this side. Caravans would come through there and be sent off toward the desert. Hundreds and hundreds of Armenians, we used to see the dead, bloated bodies floating in the river. Just Genghis Khan, Mongol horde shit. But not happening in the 13th century, happening in the 20th century. On July tw- uh, 24th, Talat sends instructions to Urfa, uh, Diel, Diel, oh my God, my mouth just will not do some of these pronunciations. I just, not being raised <laughs> around this language, my mouth is like, nope, your tongue doesn't do that. Diel Zor, uh, Diyarbakur, Instructions were sent to bury the bodies of those fallen by the roadside and not just throw them in ditches, lakes, or rivers. Uh, during the following weeks, governor generals would report from the provinces uh, st- staring, uh, staying, stating, there we go, not staring, stating that all of the Armenians had been removed from the area. Telegrams were then sent on to Talat. Uh, July 28th, another busy day for evil shit. Sabit, the governor general of the Karput province, informs the interior ministry that all the roads are filled with the bodies of women and children and time cannot be found to bury them. They're just killing so many people, they literally just don't have time to bury all the bodies. The governor general of Erzurum, that province, reports of widespread looting and rape. On August 2nd, Ambassador Henry Morgenthau reports to Lot, told him that the Itahad Committee had carefully considered in all of its details the matter of crushing the Armenians 
and the policy which was being pursued, which was uh, one that had been now officially adopted. He also told, told Morgenthau that the deportations were not the result of hasty decisions, but of careful and prolonged deliberation. He's telling him, you know, they've been thinking about this for a long time. This wasn't just a, you know, knee-jerk decision. We've been wanting to do this for years. The next day, in response to unofficial German protests about large-scale murders, rapes, and tortures inflicted on the Armenians, uh, uh, deportees on the highways, which was creating a bad impression on some Americans, a circular telegram is sent advising against attacking and raping Armenians on the highways. Sorry if that's worded weirdly, but how, how crazy is that shit? There, there's, they send this telegram. Uh, it's, it's not advising them to stop uh, raping and killing. It's just advising them to stop doing that on the highways. Right, they actually sent like a government telegram. Just, guys, guys, hey, whoa, whoa, how many times do I have to tell you? Enough with the attacking and raping and the killing on the highways. I know, listen, I know it's a pain in the ass to drag these folks back into their houses, you know, and rape and beat them there, but you know, it, it's got to be done. What are we, savages? A little bit of dignity, a little bit of class, right? You're making this whole genocide thing seem uh, distasteful to some of our neighbors. On August 11th, roughly 5,000 imprisoned Armenian intellectuals in Sivas are taken out of the city and slain. On August 12th, the end of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan that year, first day of the three-day holiday of Bahram, or Bayram, no massacres carried out during these days as if it's a time off for rest. Uh, okay, uh-huh, interesting. Just uh, gotta respect God, gotta take a break. <laughs> gotta take a break, everybody, from the butchering, and we gotta recharge our rape and pillage batteries. Praise God. And, and to be clear, if I hadn't already said this, uh, just like when I discussed Christians in, in history doing horrible shit, I don't think that means all Christians, you know, thought that stuff was okay, you know, uh, or that most thought it was okay. Same here for Muslims. Many Muslims in the Ottoman Empire uh, were, you know, just as bad as the Nazis in Germany a few decades later, but they didn't get to represent Islam as a whole, not even close, just know that I know that. I'd like to think you do, but you know, outrage culture. Uh, on August 28th, instructions are issued forbidding the purchase of property from Armenian deportees. So apparently, you know, some of these Armenians have been able to sell some of their stuff and the young Turks were like, oh, da, 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 da. Ah, don't give him money. Come on, just take it from him. Uh, one survivor, Haig Bartonian, later remembered, day by day, the men contingent of the caravan got smaller and smaller. Under pretext of not killing them, if they would hand over liras and gold coins, men would be milked by the military police of what little money they had. Then they would be killed anyway. Days wore on. We marched through mountain roads and valleys. Those who could not keep up were put out of their misery. Always bodies were found strewn by the wayside, the caravan getting smaller each day. At one place, my little grandmother, like Jeremiah incarnate, loudly cursed the Turkish government for their inhumanity. Pointing to us children, she asked, what is the fault of children to be subjected to such suffering? It was too much for a military police officer to bear. He pulled out his dagger, plunged it into my grandmother's back. The more he plunged his dagger, the more my beloved Nana asked for heaven's curses on him and his kind. Unable to silence her with repeated dagger thrusts, the military officer mercifully pumped some bullets into her and ended her life. First my uncle, now my grandmother, were left unmourned and unburied by the wayside we moved on. These guys, yeah, just literally just Nazis before they were Nazis. On August 31st, Talat, August 31st, Talat tells the German ambassador that the Armenian question no longer exists. He feels confident they have answered it. He doesn't believe Armenians will be a problem anymore, not that they actually ever were. In September of 1915, Ambassador Morgenthau really tries to help. He offers to essentially buy a little over half a million Armenian citizens from the Ottomans so that they won't be murdered. He tells the Young Turks he'll raise a million dollars to transport the remaining Armenians to the U.S. Just let them leave. Here's some money. We'll pay for everything. You know, just be on your way. You'll be rid of them. The Ottoman Empire accepts his proposal. Morgenthau tries to make preparations writing to the U.S. The Armenians are a moral, hardworking race would make good citizens to settle the less thickly populated parts of the Western states. But then the Young Turks, uh, who should be referred to as the Old Devils, block the exit of refugees instead of letting, you know, Morgenthau pay to get them out. They go back against their deal because, you know, they're huge pieces of shit. That's how much they hated them. They wouldn't even allow someone to fucking pay to take them off their hands, uh, which proves the argument about killing or deporting them due to fear of them joining Russia's military efforts, you know, was bullshit. They, they just hated them. They just wanted them dead. On September 14th, 1915, the New York Times reports that 350,000 Armenians have been killed already. The number's probably very, very low to what it would actually was at that time. The New York Times would end up running 145 articles about the Armenian genocide in just 1915. 
uh, was not a secret in the U.S. So what was being done to help them now? In October, a committee would be formed in New York City called the Committee on Armenian Atrocities. In 1918, it came to be known as the Near East Relief. President Wilson would dedicate Sundays to be focused on Armenian relief, and Sunday schools should, you know, recommended to give money. Uh, in fairness to Wilson, this was how America dealt with international crises back then. Uh, primarily at this time in America's short history as a country, the conventional way to deal with international crises was through private charity and churches, not through military action. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation gave $290,000 in 1915 alone to Armenian relief. But financial aid, you know, wasn't enough. Why didn't the U.S. military intervene? For one, sending the military to the Ottoman Empire would be tantamount to declaring war, a war that most of the American public was still vehemently against entering. At this time, Americans did not want any part of World War I. Uh, the U.S. was still a year and a half away from joining the fight in World War I. Then after America entered the war against Germany and Austria-Hungary in April of 1917, Wilson still avoided declaring war on the Ottoman Empire. He felt that the American military had its hands full already. And he wasn't, you know, wrong. And President Wilson would say uh, he did not encourage intervention because the Turks had not violated the rights of Americans. And that was standard operating procedure for America at the time. Sadly, during World War I, there was just too much atrocity going on, you know, just going around for anyone to be able to stop all of it. The total number of military and civilian casualties in World War I, around 40 million, roughly 20 million deaths, roughly 21 million more wounded. Of the 20 million dead, about half civilians, it was such a big bloody motherfucker of a war being fought on three continents, a million people died in East Africa, in addition to all the deaths in Europe and Western Asia, there was just too much carnage being committed by too many powerful military machines to save everybody. Hindsight being 2020, a lot of people after the war, though, did wish they would have done more. And some, to be fair, when it was happening, wanted to do more. Former President Theodore Roosevelt was one of them. He thought just raising money from Armenians in club meetings was a bunch of bullshit and said so. In a 1915 letter to Samuel Dutton, the Armenia Committee Secretary, Roosevelt slammed the charitable acts, writing, Mass meetings on behalf of the Armenians amounts to nothing whatsoever if they are mere methods of giving a sentimental uh, but ineffective and safe outlet to the emotion of those engaged in them. Indeed, they amount to less than nothing. Until we put honor and duty first and are willing to risk something in order to achieve righteousness both for ourselves and for others, we shall accomplish nothing, and we shall earn and deserve the contempt of the strong nations of mankind. Man, Teddy motherfucking Roosevelt! Calling out some virtue signaling back in 1915. Uh, Roosevelt would advocate for quick military action against the Ottoman Empire, but would not be taken seriously. But the guy did know something about fighting, right? At the age of 39, he had led a charge himself up Kettle Hill in Cuba, charging straight into entrenched, repeating rifle fire with his Rough Riders. Dude was built out of pure... <laughs> uh, he'd be posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for his Kettle Hill bravery. Uh, directly after the war, months before Roosevelt died in 1919, he would write in another letter that the Armenian genocide was the greatest war crime of World War I. And again, he didn't use the word genocide because that wasn't around yet, but he wrote that what happened was the greatest war crime of World War I. Now back to our timeline. On October 1st, 600 Armenian orphan boys are Turkified in Herrick. Turkification was something else that was going on. It was another aspect of the Young Turks national project. It was the forced assimilate, assimilation to Turkish language, the Muslim religion, and Turkish culture. Right? Sometimes they would take the youngest kids who they thought once they were uh, adults would have no real memory of being Armenian, and they would just, you know, not discuss their past, make, forbid them to speak about their past, and just retrain them, give them new names and everything, as if they just didn't have a life before. On October 4th, the Interior Ministry advises against the need of opening orphanages and prolonging the life of any Armenian children. Yeek! Uh, they felt it was uh, most cost-effective just to kill them. So sometimes they would Turkify them, sometimes they would just... And, the, and, the, and this chaos, by the way, this timeline, they were constantly going back and forth. Like, they would have, like, one edict of, like, okay, uh, we're gonna we're gonna Turkify these kids. And then, like, a week later, they would just send something like, you know what? Second thought, fuck, kill them. Uh, one survivor of the mass murder of some Armenian children, Sam Kadorian, would later recount, Turkish military police came over and grabbed all the boys from five to 10 years old. I was about seven or eight. They grabbed me too. They threw us all into a pile on the sandy beach and just started stabbing us with their swords and bayonets. I must have been in the center because only one sword got me, nipped my cheek. Here, my cheek. He showed this scar. But I couldn't cry. I was covered with blood from the other bodies on top of me, but I couldn't cry. If I had, I would not be here today. When it was getting dark, my grandmother came and found me. She picked me up and consoled me. It hurt so much. I was crying, and she put me on her shoulder and walked around. Then some of the other parents came looking for their children. They found mostly dead bodies. 
The riverbanks there were very sandy. Some of them dug graves with their bare hands, shallow graves, and tried to bury their children in them. Others just pushed them into the river. They pushed them into the Euphrates. It's fucking madness. Stab these kids to death, right? So they wouldn't have to use bullets. Wanted to save those for the war effort. Uh, around now, the number of deported Armenians still living is estimated at a minimum of 360,000. The number of Armenian dead estimated at a minimum of 800,000. On October 8th, still in 1915, Talat requests from provincial officials documents proving Armenian treason against Turkey to justify all the massacres. And by requesting, he wanted them to just, just make it up. Just fucking whip up some bullshit documents that make it look like we had to do this. What a fucking lunatic. What are we supposed to do? Just not stab piles of kids? Come on. What, what, what are we supposed to not throw the elderly off cliffs into the river? Not rape everyone? They were uh, treasonous. Look at the documents we just wrote. On October 12th, much like the Jewish laws that would come about in the Third Reich, orders are issued forbidding marriage now with Armenian women. Not that there were a ton of Armenian women still around to be married. On October 16th, the Turkish government declares immunity from prosecution for anyone helping them carry out the massacre of Armenians. It's just open season now. Also in October, Ambassador Henry Morgenthau continues to have frustrating conversations with Talat. Uh, once when the ambassador introduced eyewitness reports of slaughter, Talat snapped back, why are you so interested in the Armenians anyway? You are a Jew. These people are Christians. What have you to complain of? Why can't you just, uh, why can't, what does he say? Why can't you let us do with these Christians as we please? Morgan Dow replied, you don't seem to realize that I am not here as a Jew, but as an American ambassador. I do not appeal to you in the name of any race or religion, but merely as a human being. Talat then reportedly looked confused and said, we treat the Americans all right too. I don't see why you should complain. It's like he just didn't understand. What do you, what do you mean human being? What, are you, what is this? What is this human being you speak of? Uh, Morgan Dow continued to complain, warning that Talat and other senior officials would eventually be held responsible before a court of public opinion, particularly in the U.S., and Talat made it clear he did not give a fuck what America thought. He said, we don't give a rap for the future. We live only for the present. Morgan Dow would later ask him, suppose a few Armenians did betray you. Is that a reason for destroying a whole race? Is that an excuse for making innocent women and children suffer? And Talat replied, those things are inevitable. And then Talat somehow managed to do something even more disturbing. This is just cartoonish. It's all cartoonish, but this is like even more cartoonish. He actually asked Morgan Thau whether the U.S. could get the New York Life Insurance Company an Equitable Life of New York, which for years had done business with some Armenians, to send a complete list of Armenian life insurance policyholders to the Turkish authorities. He said, they are practically all dead now and have left no heirs. The government is the beneficiary now. This is so just insane. It just keeps getting crazier. They've raped and killed these people by the hundreds of thousands. Now this motherfucker is asking to collect on life insurance policies of the people he ordered murdered. That's a direct equivalent uh, to like if Hitler or one of his top officials, you know, ha had said something like the following to an American diplomat in World War II. Just, uh, hello, this, this is Hitler. I'm ready to talk to you about the Jews. Am I ready to let him live? <laughs> no, that's, that's a good one. No, don't be silly. I just, I want to talk to you about some life insurance policies. I have some real issues with Russia, as you've heard. I'm sure I need more tanks and some guns and planes and things. And to get us money, I well, I was just hoping I could be the beneficiary in general of the Jewish participants. Uh, There's a final solution. Uh, hello? Are you still? Uh, him not, they, they hung up on me. Uh, Ambassador Morgenthau lost his temper at all this and said, you will get no such list from me. And got up and left. Again, he tried. Wasn't a lot he could do, but he tried. On October 28th, 1915, per earlier instructions uh, sent by Talat, that motherfucker, 80,000 Ar Armenian deportees left the Konya station for uh, Byzanti on this date on their way to the final destination. Uh, it's written, and it was written final destination. Eerie, you know, eerily similar to Hitler's final solution. Uh, these 80,000 were deportees from cities near Constantinople from other Armenian communities in western parts of Turkey. In November, Talat advises authorities in Aleppo that Morgenthau knows too much. Writing, it is important that foreigners who are in those parts shall be persuaded that the expulsion of the Armenians is in truth only deportation. It is important that to save appearances, a show of gentle dealing shall be made for a time and the usual measures be taken in suitable places. You know, so he's just saying like, don't fuck them up in front of everyone. Just, you know, not in the road. Not, gosh, God, guys, not in the road. Take them out of the bushes. Aware that the press coverage looks bad for them, Talat orders that remaining Armenians now be taken and killed in places outside the view of foreigners, especially American consuls. And to help hide future war crimes, the government also instructs officials to court-martial any Armenian reporting any of these events to any foreigner. 
but they don't do a very good job of hiding all this uh, atrocity, all this hate. It's too much, too much to hide. Later in November, Dr. Schott, a German army physician stationed near the village of uh, Dierlzor, will uh, report counting 7,000 severed Armenian heads near the Euphrates River. Jesus. And who, fucking, how crazy is that just to count them too? That's, that's, you're counting heads for a long time to get to 7,000. Uh, so they didn't hide things too well. November 17th, Lord Robert Cecil, the British diplomat during World War I, protests the Turkish narrative that the massacres are a response to Armenian revolts. He tells his superiors that the murders are the result of a premeditated plan on part of the Turkish government. While the British government would not immediately respond, Cecil's experience seeing the many horrors of World War I would lead him to write memorandum on proposals for diminishing the occasion of future wars, which was the document that propelled Britain into later joining the League of Nations forerunner to the Illuminati, uh, I mean, United Nations. And he would later be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1937 for his decades-long career in public service. Uh, more documentation, solid documentation of genocide. The next day, November 18th, circular telegram is sent ordering the deportation of specifically Armenian children. They wanted to make sure they got rid of all the Armenians. Deportations continue. On December 4th, the Ottoman government officials prepare a list of 70,000 Armenian individuals to be deported from Constantinople. Two days later, a circular telegram instructs that no Armenian is to be left alive in the eastern provinces. On December 14th, Ottoman officials issue orders to kill Armenian priests. The next day, a circular telegram clarifies that the purpose of the deportations is, in fact, annihilation. And I know a lot of this is repetitive, but they just kept sending out, I guess, just to different officials, like, hey, to be clear, just to make sure that you know what we're saying, annihilation. On December 25th, orders are issued for the deportation of all children except those who do not remember their parents. These kids are to be Turkified. Talked about that again just a little bit ago. Meanwhile, soldiers taking Armenians to the desert are told to try and convert Armenians to Islam. Those who agree are to be, you know, agree to be Turkified, should be allowed to live, no longer be deported. But then a later telegram instructs the handlers not to let them convert to Islam until the Armenians have reached their final destination and then maybe let them live. Then another telegram would say that even if they do convert, the Armenians, once in the desert, should still be killed. What kind of fucked up internal meetings? the Turks having, making these kind of decisions, you know? Like one guy's like, Pasha, some of the Armenians are willing to announce their God and worship Allah and join in our fight against the infidels. So should we allow them to live? Yes, I like second Pasha. We are killing them because they're Christian, right? Yes, Pasha, that is right. We should let them live as Muslims. But third Pasha, uh, where would they live? We've already taken or burned all of their things. Excellent point, Pasha. They should still go to desert but be allowed there to live as Muslim brothers and sisters. Most wise, third Pasha, but how will we feed them in the desert? Ah, I like the way you think, Pasha. Second Pasha, uh, maybe we just kill them all, no matter what. Yes, first and third Pasha, that is most excellent plan. Let us eat. All this hard planning, building great appetite. This is fucking insanity. It just, yeah. Uh, what kind of shit show? On January 11th, 1916, the government sends instructions to local authorities to prevent foreign officers from photo uh, photographing dead Armenians. Just hide, hide, hide. Uh, meanwhile, the same January, Henry Morgenthau decides he has to head back to the U.S. He did. He tried. He couldn't accomplish anything. and It's, it's time to leave. He would later write, my failure to stop the destruction of the Armenians uh, had made Turkey for me a place of horror. I had reached the end of my resources. Yeah, I bet he, eats the, I bet he reached the end of his fucking sanity. During his last visit with Talat, Talat tells him that talking about the Armenians with anyone will be pointless. Regardless, Morgenthau will keep raising money to try and save Armenians once back in the U.S. Uh, January 3rd, 1916, uh, kind of going to move a little faster with the timeline now after a few more dates. Uh, the governor general of Aleppo informs Talat that only 10% of the Armenian deportees remain alive and measures are taken, uh, you know, being taken to dispose of them also, the rest. On January 29th, the Interior Ministry provisionally exempts from deportation Armenians needed for the running of the railways to take other Armenians to die in the desert. How kind of the ministry. Uh, the families and children of Armenians working on the railways are still deported. Uh, there was just no limit to their cruelty. They're going to let the, you know, Armenians running the trains, the trains taking other Armenians to their death, I'll let them keep working a little bit longer. But, but load up their families. Make sure that those people have to help load up their own families to send them away. On the same day, the Interior Ministry orders the deportation of the Armenians constructing roads as soon as the construction work is finished, you know? So just to be clear, but once the trains are done, then just, you know, the last train takes the guys working on the train and, you know, gets rid of them too. On February 16th, an American application to provide relief for Armenians is rejected by the Ottoman Empire. 
That same day, the Russian army pushes into and occupies the Ottoman province of Erzurum. They find no Armenian men or children still living, only a handful of captive Armenian women in the entire fucking province. On March 19th, a report is sent to the Interior Ministry from Aleppo informing that 75% of the Armenians previously in the desert are now dead. The next day, instructions are sent to seize Armenian orphans with the pretext of giving them food, but then to kill them. Kids were, be, uh, were to be killed by either being poisoned, drowned, stabbed, shot, or burned alive. Not kidding. On April 15th, the Russian army occupies the city now of Trabzon, with the exception of a few Armenian orphans and widows secretly sheltered by Greeks. No Armenians are found still alive in the city. It would later be discovered that roughly 50,000 Armenians previously living there had been murdered, generally via drownings or burned alive in mass. They would literally, I had to find this from several sources because I didn't want to believe it was true. They would lit literally gather a bunch of these people together, douse them with gasoline, and just set them on fucking fire. Uh, some Turkish prisoners who had apparently witnessed some of these scenes were horrified and maddened at remembering the sight. They told the Russians who captured them that the stench of the burning flesh permeated the air for many days. It's fucking savages. The young Turks and the goons, fucking savages. Uh, on May 24th, the New York Times reports that 80,000 Armenians had died of starvation around Damascus. Uh, 60,000 Armenian deportees are reported scattered around Central Arabia and other, Northern Syria on May 30th just being walked around aimlessly in the desert until they drop dead. The Arab government of Dirlzor, th that district, Ali Swad, is sent to Baghdad on June 14th to be punished and possibly killed for refusing to carry out uh, some extermination orders uh, for these deportees. He's replaced by Sali Zeki, a man reputed for his cruelty or with a reputation for cruelty who has no problem dealing death to the Armenians. Uh, on July 15th, it's reported that the Turkish army fighting Russia on the Caucasian, on the Caucasian front. It's so weird to read because obviously in America, Caucasian generally is not referring to a part of the Caucasus, uh, has lost 60,000 men to starvation, disease, and other causes. Things still not looking good for the Turkish army. So at least the Turkish army is doing bad right now. Uh, the government uh, somehow spins this though, blames it on the Armenians. Of course. On July 23rd, Armenian military doctors in Sivas are told to convert to Islam. When they refuse, they're killed on the spot. On August 1st, the Interior Ministry abolishes any remaining legal rights of the Armenian community on the grounds that there is no remaining Armenian community left in Turkey. On August 8th, despite saying that there are no Ar Armenians left, 15,000 Armenian deportees are removed from Aleppo to the desert. Killings and deportations continue. Let's now jump to 1917. On February 4th, one of the three Pashas is promoted. Ministry of the Interior Talat now becomes the Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire, becoming the de facto Prime Minister. Uh, that royal piece of shit, now the head piece of shit, at least publicly. Uh, did I mention that in addition to the Americans, or, or excuse me, Armenians who died, uh, and the Greeks and the Assyrians, this evil fuck also helped orchestrate the mass deportations of ethnic Kurds out of the Ottoman Empire during World War I. Roughly 700,000 reportedly forcefully deported, Roughly half would die, and then following the war, the new Turkish government would attempt to genocide more of the Kurds. Man, just that fucking pan-Turkism, good old nationalism. On March 11th, 1917, some good news, kind of. Allied forces occupy Baghdad. They're beating the Turks. They're pushing further into Ottoman territory. Uh, sadly, though, 450 miles away, 200,000 Armenians are being starved to death near the city of Aleppo. On November 27th, 1917, President Wilson and Henry Morgenthau chat President Wilson urges Morgenthau to write a book based on everything he's been telling him, on his experiences. Morgenthau starts working on his manuscript. It'll become a book called Ambassador Morgenthau's Story. As he worked on it throughout 1918, Morgenthau gave public speeches in the U.S. warning that the Greeks and Assyrians were also being subjected to the same methods of deportation and wholesale massacre as the Armenians, and that two million Armenians, Greeks, and Assyrians had already perished. On March 3rd, 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litov uh, Brest is signed by Russia, Turkey, and Germany. Lenin and the Bolsheviks have taken over Imperial Russia, and they don't want to be in World War I anymore. We've covered that in kind of a few other sucks. Russia, out. This is really bad for the remaining Armenians inside the Ottoman Empire because Russia had been kicking the shit out of them. Now Russia withdraws their troops, and since the Bolsheviks are not big religion fans, the Christian bond between the Russians and the Armenians is broken. Talat now publicly declares that he will grant amnesty to any remaining Armenians, since there's no threat anymore, that the Armenians are now going to collaborate with Russia, you know, because it's different now. He's like, Armenians, let's be friends. 
All that shit before, the raping, the burning, the stabbing, the beheading, the pushing off of the cliffs, the starving, the stealing of your houses, starving in the desert, yada, yada. Yeah, it was business. Business has changed. So let's not be sourpuss. You know, shake it and move on. Okily dokily, bygones and all that jazz. That was very nice. I know it's a little bore out there. Uh, it's not, I don't know what that was, but I kept thinking of, you know, Kazakhstan and whatever Borat talks about his movies. It's similar. Talat, of course, because he was such an epic piece of shit on par with Hitler, Stalin, every other heartless butchering tyrant in history, uh, was lying when he talked about this amnesty. He just wanted to lure what few Armenians were around to their deaths. Nine days later, on March 12th, Talat, uh, Pasha, Talat Pasha's buddy, Enver Pasha, orders the killing of all civilian Armenians over five years of age and any remaining Armenians in the Turkish military within 48 hours. Um, May 28th, 1918, during a power vacuum left when Imperial Russia transforms to Communist Russia under the Bolsheviks during the chaos and revolts and lack of governance during the ongoing and widespread revolts of the Russian Revolution, an Armenian Republic is re proclaimed in Russian Transcaucasia. Although short-lived, the First Republic's brief independence uh, fraught with war, territorial disputes, and a mass influx of refugees from Ottoman uh, Armenia, uh, bringing with them disease and starvation. But the Armenian Republic, the first independent Armenian state since the Middle Ages. Uh, Turkey will invade and conquer this new republic, sadly, in 1920. Then they'll fight back and kick some of the Turks out, and then Russia will take them over in 1921 and rule them as a Soviet satellite state until the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. Man, again, fucking terrible location. Terrible location to try and have a country. The poor Armenians. On July 24th, remaining Armenians are supposedly granted amnesty again. Eh, not true again. Two months later, more massacring. September 15th, uh, the three-day massacre by Turkish military forces under the command of Nuri Pasha, Enver Pasha's younger brother, and Halil Pasha, Enver's uncle, result in the death of 30,000 Armenian civilians in the city of Baku. On September 19th, Allied forces opened a large-scale offensive on the Syrian front. They're aided by an Armenian legion recruited from uh, Armenian colonies throughout the world. This is fucking awesome. Armenians from all over the world banding together to fight against the Turks. Hail Nimrod. Uh, on October 1st, they are successful. On that date, Allied forces captured Damascus. The Allies would go in to capture Beirut, Aleppo in the following weeks. Bojangles just stood up on his three legs and howled. He's pumped for Allied victories. Uh, with the arrival of the British and French armies and the Armenian Legion, 125,000 remnants of the deported Armenians are rescued from the desert. Good news, fucking finally. Some of the Armenians who have been marched to the desert to die are saved. Hail Nimrod. On October 29th, the young Turks resign. Uh, they decide to secretly reorganize, though, many of their party as the Regeneration Party. And they get away with it. Different name, same shit. Uh, on November 2nd, Talat, Enver, and Jamal, the three Pashas, they do flee uh, from the area, though. They flee Turkey on a German freighter to hide from war crime prosecutions. At least those assholes had to, you know, flee for a little bit. Also, while they get away right now, Armenian vengeance is coming, and it's going to be pretty fucking sweet uh, for at least those guys. On, on November 11th, a general armistice is declared between the Allies and the Central Powers, ending the fighting of World War I. That, of course, becomes in the U.S. Veterans Day. A month later, on December 11th, Talat, Enver, Jamal, Summoned by the 5th Committee of the Turkish Parliament to appear for an inquiry within 10 days regarding their war crimes. For some weird reason, the Three Stooges don't show up. Beginning on February 1st, 1919, a court-martial to address war crimes convened in Constantinople. Uh, one of the people who appeared, the new Grand Vizier of Turkey, Ahmet Tevik Pasha, would attempt to justify the massacres on the basis of false accusations against the Armenians. It's just like, hey, hey, come on, give us a break here. Some dude had told us the Armenians were raising a ruckus, committing all kinds of trees, and what were we supposed to do? Actually look into it? Well, we were supposed to not march them to the desert and rape them and push them off cliffs and set them on fire and cut off their heads and stab grandmas and drown kids? I mean, in hindsight, yeah, you know, it looks a little questionable, but some of those involved in the genocide will be sentenced to death by the military tribunal and publicly hanged, but not many. It seems like it was sacrificial lambs, not the leaders. Many of the perpetrators would never be charged. It seems like it was a bunch of bullshit for show for the international community. The three Pashas, Talat, Enver, Jamal, uh, they would be condemned to death in absentia, though. It feels like this was done for show, though, again, as well. Uh, the new Turkish government just didn't want them trying to lead again. The people who are leading it currently, who I'll talk about in a little bit, they just didn't get along with them. Uh, they also didn't really try and track them down. Uh, and then some, uh, despite the war being over, uh, some, you know, in the, uh, in Turkey at the time still think the allies can be beat. Halil Pasha and Kuchuk Talat, both accused war criminals, escape from Constantinople, join a Turkish army being built in the desert by Mustafa Kemal, who would go on to become the first president of Turkey. 
A year later, on January 21st, 1920, more Armenian massacres, the Turkish army formed in the desert, the one led by Mustafa Kemal, who is beloved in Turkey like fucking George Washington, uh, attacks allied French forces who are in Marash. The French were protecting Armenian refugees who had moved there following World War I. Overwhelmed by Kemal's attack, they retreat, abandon 10,000 Armenians who are then fucking slaughtered. And fuck my face, what is happening in the story? It just never ends. More Armenian men, women, children, butchered. This battle kicks off the Turkish War of Independence, which will kick out allied forces and establish the new nation of Turkey in 1923. Mustafa Kemal today heralded as a Turkish national hero. Just statues of this son of a bitch all over the place. Uh, literally illegal to say anything bad about him. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. The Turkish parliament grants him the surname uh, Ataturk. Ataturk. In 1934, it means father of the Turks and recognition for the role he played in building the modern Turkish Republic. This is a good dad. Mowing down any motherfucker who isn't, you know, just uh, closely related to him. Mustafa, to be fair, would actually do a lot of good things to secularize and modernize Turkey. He'd bring voting rights to women. He'd, he'd open thousands of schools across Turkey, and he can still go get fucked. Uh, he can burn in hell. Uh, talking about the good stuff he did feels like talking about the good shit that Hitler or Stalin or Mao Zedong did, you know? I hope some Armenians dig up his body, piss on it, and just burn his shitty bones. He was a war criminal who butchered non-Turks, even though he was quote-unquote secular. He also led a government that carried out a ridiculous policy of Turkification. He continued with that pan-Turkism bullshit. Non-Turkish languages were forbidden under his policies. Armenians and Greeks explicitly forbidden from being employed by the government. Uh, Armenians forced to change their last names to traditional Turkish last names. Uh, during World War II, Armenians, Assyrians, Greeks, Jews, but not Turkish Muslims, forced to work for the government in labor camps, and on and on and on. There's a huge list of his outrageous policies. Fuck Mustafa Kemal. He, per he perpetuated the perception that Armenians... Uh, other non-Turks were second-class citizens, subhumans, well into the mid-20th century. Okay, let's get to some good news. Let's check in on the three Pashas. Let's go back to uh, 1921. Uh, find out what fate awaited them in the wake of their World War I war crimes. March 15th, 1921. This is my favorite part of the story. In Berlin, cold and windy day, Talat Pasha, mastermind of the Armenian genocide, third stooge, head fuckface, living a comfortable life in Germany. He'd been condemned to death, you know, as we said, in absentia for, by the war crimes trial. But he's doing great. He's got plenty of money. He's having nice meals. Probably made a fortune stealing ship from the Armenians he condemned to die. He's living in a house in the affluent Berlin neighborhood of Charlottenburg. And you know who else is in Charlottenburg that day? Sagaman Talarian. Do you remember him? We met him way back in the timeline in June of 1915. When he was 19, being marched to the Syrian desert with his Armenian family for being Armenian, we met him when he was watching his sisters get dragged off into the bushes and get raped, watch his mom get shot dead, watch his brother's head get split in two with an ax. He was beaten unconscious, woke up dead next to the mangled body of his sister, and then that motherfucker escaped. He lived, waited for a chance at revenge. He joined Operation Nemesis, named after the Greek goddess of divine retribution, Hail Lucifina. Operation Nemesis was a covert operation and an assassination campaign organized, carried out by the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. An Armenian political party founded in 1890 that still exists today, has mostly existed without even a, a formal country to call home between 1920 and 1922. Operation Nemesis carried out a number of assassinations of former Ottoman political and military figures for their roles in the Armenian genocide, right? If that fucking kangaroo court wasn't going to do anything about them, they were. And it had to be run from the shadows, right? For most of its existence uh, due to, you know, uh, other governments being in charge, you know, like in 1920, the, the Soviets were in charge at the end of 1920. And on the morning of March 15th, 1921, this guy, Talarian, he watches Talat walk out of his front door, his nice little house. He knew when he'd be leaving home. He follows him down the street. He knew because uh, what his, his like routine was because he had rented an apartment near Talat's house so he could study his every move. He crosses the street to get a good look at Talat, for, uh, Talat from the opposite sidewalk. Then he crosses once again, walks past him just to make sure, absolutely sure it's him, looks at him right in the face. Yep, him, pulls out a 9 millimeter Luger pistol, shoots that motherfucker in the neck, one shot, one kill, a uh, 46-year-old Talat dead in seconds. And Talarian just stands there, soaking in the revenge, waits for the German authorities to arrest him. He immediately admits, yep, sure did, fucking shot that piece of shit, told the arresting officers why he'd killed that fuck, and then after a two-day trial, he's found innocent by a German court 
on grounds of temporary insanity because of the traumatic experience he'd gone through during the genocide. Hail Nimrod, love me some righteous vengeance. And it doesn't get much more righteous than that. Right after his trial, this guy would move to Cleveland, go Browns. He bounced around a bit after that between the US and Europe, get married, end up settling down in San Francisco where he would work at the post office. He would die at the age of 64, buried in Fresno, California, where there used to be a huge Armenian population at the uh, Ararat Masa Cemetery. Sorry if I'm not saying that right. An Armenian cemetery, for years, the only Armenian cemetery built outside of Armenia in the Middle East. Huge monument dedicated to him there right now. Hail Sagaman Talarian. The man he killed, viewed by many in Turkey as a hero, by the way, Talat, today has schools, streets, mosques named after that piece of shit. Uh, Before we move on uh, to the fate of the next Pasha piece of shit, an interesting story came from the killing of this one. While Talarian awaited trial in Berlin, uh, Raphael Lemkin, 21-year-old Polish Jew, we mentioned him up top in the episode, studying linguistics at the University of, I've completely given up on this word, it's L-V-O-V, it's like Lvov, uh, came upon a short news item on Talat's assassination in a local paper. Lemkin was intrigued, brought the case to the attention of one of his professors. Lemkin asked why the Armenians did not have Talat arrested for the massacre. And the professor said there was no law under which he could be arrested. He said, consider the case of the farmer who owns a flock of chickens. He kills them, and this is his business. If you interfere, you are trespassing. Lemkin asked, it is a crime for Talarian to kill a man, but it is not a crime for his oppressor to kill more than a million men? This is most inconsistent. Uh, Yeah, most inconsistent, putting it very mildly. After this interaction, he drops out of his program, enrolls in law school, where he scours ancient and modern legal codes for laws prohibiting ethnic slaughter, just slaughter in general. Then a decade later, 1933, Lemkin, now a lawyer, makes plans to speak before an international criminal law conference in Madrid. In his paper, he has called attention to Hitler's ascent and to the Ottoman slaughter of the Armenians. If it happened once before, he argues, it could happen again. Lemkin had prepared a law that would prohibit the destruction of nations, races, and religious groups. But he wouldn't even get to go to Madrid. He wasn't allowed to present his paper. Why not? because the Polish foreign minister wanted to gain favor with Hitler, uh, didn't want to offend, anger him. However, Lemkin's draft was read aloud in his absence at the conference, but no one seemed to agree with him, even lost his job. After being accused of trying to use his research to elevate the position of Jews above other religious groups in Europe. Then in September of 1939, he'd flee Warsaw with only a shaving kit and a summer coat to escape the Holocaust, the Holocaust he tried to prevent. He'd make his way to the US where he would speak with President FDR about the plight of the Jews in Europe, He lobbied politicians for actions. Uh, As he did, he remembered a speech given by Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who'd said that the world was in the presence of a crime without a name. So he gave that crime a name. He coined the term genocide in his 1944 book, Axis Rule and Occupied Europe. Interesting Ottoman to Nazi, Armenian to Jewish connection there. Uh, Back to the end of the timeline of the Armenian genocide and its aftermath. In November of 1921, Kamal puts an end to the promise of International War Crimes Tribunal. Uh, of one by negotiating a prisoner swap. Some incarcerated Brits were traded for some Turkish war criminals in British custody. Uh, Kamal, again, Turkey's George Washington, doing what he can do to free some fellow butchers and make sure they don't get to uh, be prosecuted. Uh, More assassinations of Ottoman government officials follow. On December 6, 1921, uh, uh, Halim Pasha assassinated in Rome. In Rome, excuse me, Operation Nemesis strikes again. Halim was the Grand Vizier uh, or Prime Minister of the Sultan in power directly preceding the coup uh, of the Young Turks. And then he did work with the Young Turks as a kind of figurehead until 1917. He had managed to maintain some political power during the genocide and even signed his signature on Armenian deportation orders. So like Sagaman uh, Talarian in Germany, Armenian assassin uh, Arshavar uh, Sharakian rents an apartment near his target. And one day when Halim pulls up his, uh, to his house in a taxi, this guy shoots him down. Uh, the following year, the same assassin is in Berlin, and on April 17th, 1922, he kills two more high-ranking young Turks, architects of the genocide. Hail Arshavir Sarakian, the righteous sword of Nimrod. Uh, fucking, you know, those Turkish butchers. Butchers. Uh, Sarakian moves to New York following these last assassinations, gets married, has a daughter, moves to New Jersey, and then dies in 1973 at the age of 73. Uh, he is buried in Hackensack. A few months later, on July 21st, 1922, Operation Nemesis will claim a final victim. In Tiflis, Georgia, 50-year-old Jamal Pasha, one of the three Pashas, former minister of the Navy, 5th Army commander in Syria, is assassinated by three Armenians while trying to broker a deal between the Bolsheviks and the Afghans. He is now working for as a sort of military revolutionary consultant. Hard to find details about this assassination, but numerous genocide websites do provide pictures of this motherfucker looking real, 
real dead. Hail Nimrod. What of the third stooge, the third Pasha, Enver, in the fall of 1921, not welcome in Turkey because he and Mustafa Kemal didn't get along, he heads to Moscow where he manages to gain favor with the Bolsheviks. That November, Lenin sends him to uh, Bukhara in what was then uh, the uh, Bukharan People's Soviet Republic, land that sits uh, now in part of like uh, Uzbekistan, Takistan, uh, I believe is how you say, or no, sorry, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan today. It's set above Iran and Afghanistan. This fucker was uh, now sent in to suppress local Muslims who didn't want to be oppressed by Bolsheviks. Bolsheviks had slaughtered over 25,000 local Muslims already before he showed up. When he got there, he made a bunch of Bolshevik uh, military contacts. Then he got as many as he could to flip to the side of the rebels, right? Uh, rebels, yeah, he doesn't want to kill Muslims. Uh, he was like, suck my dick, Lenin. Pan Turkism forever. He becomes the supreme commander of rebel forces. Then on August 4th, as he's allowed uh, his troops to sell, or as he, as he is allowing his troops to celebrate the Islamic holiday of Tabaski, uh, while, while he sat in his headquarters surrounded by 30 guards, he hears approaching troops. Surprise, surprise, the Bolsheviks have launched a sneak attack. A Red Army Cavalry Brigade is headed right for him. And who are they being led by? Yakov Melkumov, an Armenian. All right. Uh, this is awesome. A 40-year-old Enver hopped on his horse, fled. Yakov the Armenian rode after his ass. Hell was riding with him. Enver made it to the village of Shah... Uh, I can't fucking say any of these words. There was a, Every word is, is like 11th level difficulty. Um, he, made it to, he made it to a village that has no pronunciation guide in English anywhere on earth. And he hides out for four days. Then a Red Army officer in disguise infiltrates the village, discovers his location. Then uh, this Armenian and his troops ride in. They find Enver. He shot down a machine gun fire. And then Melgamov, by, uh, with his military sword, puts a little extra sauce on the victory by cutting Enver's fucking head off. All three Pashas now dead, all dead at the hands of Armenians. How fitting. But sadly, the persecution of the Armenians at the hands of the Ottomans is still not over. September 9th, an advance guard of the Turkish army. Enters Smyrna, a.k.a. Izmir, pillages Armenian and Greek homes and stores. Armenians and Greeks are killed by the thousands. And actually, before I forget, one of the things with the names here is because of that pan-Turkism, they didn't just try and change the name of people. They also changed the name of all the fucking cities and towns. <laughs> so, like, so many of the locations in this suck. There's, like, three different names for them. Ah, they, just, they couldn't have made it more complicated. Uh, but anyway, September 9th, advance guard of the Turkish army enters Smyrna, a.k.a. Izmir, pillages Armenian and Greek homes and stores, Armenians and Greeks killed by the thousands. Within 24 hours, 50,000 houses, 24 churches, 28 schools, five consulates, seven clubs, five banks, an unknown number of additional stores and warehouses destroyed. And I got to say, I don't know also where my dad was that day. I text him about it. I'm like, where were you on September 9th, 1922? And he didn't even get back to me. And that's weird. Following summer, after several more atrocities are committed on July 24th, 1923, the Treaty of uh, Lausanne, uh, signed by Turkey and allies in Switzerland, the French, British, Italy, Japan, Greece, Romania, all agreed to end ongoing conflicts with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they will get away with everything they did. The treaty does not mention Armenia or the Armenians. No mention of prosecution for the war criminals. Former British Prime Minister David Lloyd George called the treaty an abject, cowardly, and infamous surrender. The Ottoman Empire is officially finished, but not really. It's a lot of the same players, same shit, new name. The newly named Turkish nationalist state is given now international recognition. Allied armies start to evacuate the following month. On October 29th, the Republic of Turkey is proclaimed by the Turkish Grand National Assembly with Mustafa Kemal as its president. That man who had led many a massacre against the Armenians with the Turkish National Army. National Army. One last date for today's timeline, November 25th, 1946. Former U.S. Ambassador Henry Morgenthau Sr. passes away at the age of 90 following a cerebral hemorrhage, the man who tried to talk sense into the Young Turks. And with that, let's hop out of today's Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Crazy story, right? Uh, so tragic that it's not more commonly known. Following World War I, Armenia, as we've laid out, became part of the Soviet Union. Uh, they finally declared their independence in 1990, which was officially recognized after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91, after being subjugated by foreign rulers for most of their existence. The population of Armenia today, a little over 3 million. Estimated around 5 million people of Armenian origin live around the world. Outside of Armenia, they live mainly in Russia, France, Georgia, Lebanon, Iran, uh, Syria and the U.S. Uh, about 200,000 live in Glendale, California, just north of Los Angeles. Not many live in Turkey anymore, not surprising. 
Only between 40 and 50,000 are left there. The majority of them in Istanbul, which was Constantinople. Turkish Armenian citizens do currently enjoy the same rights and privileges, privileges as other Turkish citizens, kind of. Armenians in Turkey practice their religion freely in their own churches, teach in, in, their, in, in their own language, in their own schools. Uh, they publish newspapers, books, and magazines in Armenian. Uh, they do have their own social and cultural institutions, but they also still live with the cultural memory of having been murdered in massive amounts by the Ottoman Empire and recent Turkification efforts that tried to de-Armenianize them. And they can't legally talk about what happened to their people. Acknowledging the genocide is not only considered a huge insult in Turkey to Turkey, but as of 2005, actually a crime that you can go to prison for a couple years for. It's literally illegal. If I was a Turkish podcaster, not kidding, this episode would see me lose everything and be thrown in prison for years, I would probably mysteriously disappear. Article 301 is an article of the Turkish Penal Code making it illegal to insult Turkey, the Turkish nation, Turkish government institutions, or Turkish national heroes such as Mustafa Kemal. What a fucking bunch of fucking babies. Make it illegal. You, you can't legally make fun of me, guys. Thank God I don't live in Turkey. Thank God I get to live somewhere where it is very legal for me to say something like, I don't know, uh, Mustafa Kemal can suck my dick. Or Mustafa Kemal was a racist butcher piece of shit. I hope his bones are ground into toast and sprinkled in Armenian fucking toilets so hundreds of thousands of the descendants of the unarmed men, women, and children he killed can shit on his fucking remains. That's kind of fun, you know, for me to be able to say. Thank you, America. I appreciate that freedom greatly. Uh, today, Turkey is ran by a corrupt and garbage government. The regime of the current president, but really dictator, Recep uh, Erdogan, uh, he can get fucked too. This despot has arrested hundreds of journalists, closed or taken over dozens of media outlets, prevented journalists and their families from traveling. Like so many ruling Turks, he is so afraid of the truth. Uh, by some accounts, Turkey currently accounts for one third of all imprisoned journalists uh, in the world. In 2012 and 2003, the Committee to Protect Journalists ranked Turkey as the worst journalist jailer in the world, even ahead of Iran and China. And they haven't improved in recent years. They've recently enacted new laws that have expanded both the state's power to block websites that citizens can visit, have expanded the surveillance capability of their intelligence organizations. They continue to this day to brainwash citizens with propaganda. They continue to refuse to acknowledge their past evil deeds because their government is still ran by men with moral compasses on par with the three poshas. Uh, the international community still hesitant to hold them accountable for any of this. The U.S. dragged its feet in acknowledging the Armenian genocide all the way until 2019 for fear of losing Turkey as a military ally. Even then, while both bodies of Congress did agree to recognize the events in Turkey as a genocide, President Trump did not call it a genocide in an effort to better relations between Turkey and the U.S. Turkey, though, still furious. They called the U.S.'s decision shameful and argued that the designation of genocide has no historical or legal basis. Turkish leader Erdogan said in a televised speech, from here, I am addressing U.S. public opinion in the entire world. This step which was taken is worthless and we do not recognize it. And then he said, in our faith, genocide is definitely banned. We consider such an accusation to be the biggest insult to our people. What a fucking preposterous argument. Oh, we couldn't have done it because it was banned in our religion. We could not have done that. The Quran is very clear. There's no real butchering of one of our men and the women and the children by the hundreds of thousands. It's impossible. Here, look, bring the Armenian family close to me. Now give me a gun. And then he just like fucking fumbles around like, like he can't doesn't know how to use a gun anymore. Can't pull the trigger. See, I can't, I can't even pull the trigger. That's a law. Preventing me from doing what I'm not supposed to do. Here, hand me that Cuban sandwich. See, I, I can't even eat it. Like, he just fumbles around. There's pork. It's my, well, God forbids it. This guy's a fucking clown. Uh, Erdogan went on to threaten to shut down an air base in Turkey that hosts U.S. nukes. Very important base. Integral to U.S. military presence in the Middle East. Uh, this, you know, makes the U.S. nervous for understandable reasons. Uh, you know, Turkey's threats, not empty threats. If Trump would have went hard with accusations of genocide, it literally could have led to war. If Biden made a big speech about it tomorrow, we could end up in war. That's how fucking crazy Erdogan and the Turkish government is. In 2011, lawmakers in France's National Assembly, the lower house of parliament, voted overwhelmingly in favor of a draft law outlining, or outlined, excuse me, Armenian genocide denial. And in response, Turkey cut off all economic, political, and military relations with France. Ridiculous. How can you ever heal if you just refuse to acknowledge the wound? The Turks denying the Armenian genocide it makes about as much sense as the U.S. denying a history of slavery and segregation, right? The past is full of atrocities for almost everyone. To acknowledge your nations or ancestors or races or cultures, hand and committing them doesn't make you a monster. It makes you a mature, evolved meat sack interested in being better than your predecessors. To refuse to evolve, to hide the, from the truth behind arrogant pride, what a fucking sad, just pathetic way to live. 
The Armenian Genocide. Turkey can deny it all they want. It's, it happened. Beginning in 1913, Turkish leaders decided to exterminate every Armenian in the country. Whether a frontline soldier or pregnant woman, professor or bishop, business owner or child, didn't matter. They wanted them not just deported, but dead. They wanted to massacre 2 million people, and they almost did. That was their answer to the Armenian question. In the end, almost 1.5 million Armenians were dead, and that was just for the years surrounding World War I. If you want to go back a little further, when you include Greek and Assyrian Christians, other smaller groups of ethnic Christians, the estimated death toll from 1900 to 1923 is 3.5 to 4.3 million. And that doesn't count the Kurds. doesn't count the hundreds of thousands killed in the late 19th century. doesn't count roughly 30,000 Kurds killed by the Turks in the 1930s. doesn't count uh, continuing attacks on Kurds that are ongoing. Since the 1970s, the European Court of Human Rights has condemned Turkey for thousands of ongoing human rights abuses against Kurdish people. The judgments are related to systematic executions of Kurdish civilians, forced recruitments, torturing, forced displacements, thousands of destroyed villages, arbitrary arrests, murder, disappeared journalists. The latest judgment that I'm aware of are from 2014. Where was my dad that year? I don't know. I don't know where he was the whole year. Uh, sorry. According to David L. Phillips, more than 1,500 people affiliated with the Kurdish opposition parties and organizations were murdered by unidentified assailants between 1986, 1990. And I could go on and on. People being murdered in other countries by mysterious assassins. I digress. The Turkish government has committed so many fucked up atrocities, hard to stay focused on just one of their ethnic cleansings. Uh, back to the World War I era Armenian genocide. They systematically scapegoated Armenians through propaganda built on centuries of mistreating Armenians as second-class citizens, viewing them as, you know, less than human in ways. They disarmed them. They eliminated their leaders and thinkers, schools and education. They revoked their property, deported them on long journeys they were not intended to even survive. Many didn't. Dead bodies piled by the side of the road, dumped in rivers, simply just left to rot where they fell. The Turkish genocidal blueprint would be a blueprint for none other than Adolf Hitler. He would study it, follow it with added help of technological innovations that would allow him to kill more people, more discreetly, at a faster rate. And there continue to be genocides today. It's not a problem that's going away by any means, uh, which is why we need to keep telling these stories, which is why we need to call out the lies of regimes like the Turkish government. Thankfully, to document this atrocity, the Armenian Film Foundation took hundreds of interviews, if not thousands. I didn't count them, but it looked like a lot. And then the University of Southern California archived them into the USC Shoah Foundation Visual Archive. Here's a snippet of an interview uh, from Armenian genocide survivor Alice Shipley, interviewed in 1985, uh, who watched many Armenians die, who watched her home in Diyarbakir be confiscated and auctioned. Early part of 1915, the Turks began to take all the professors, doctors, lawyers, all the intelligentsia into prisons. And after they had butchered them in very horrible manner, then they began to take, they, they took all the men who were not professionals, boys 12 years of age up to 72 years, year of age, years of age men, and destroyed them, and then the, which left the women and children unprotected. Then they began to, to take the wealthy families out first and destroy them. And then uh, they, the, before taking them out, they would come and write Sovkiet on everybody's door. That meant exile, which meant that the following day they were going to uh, be taken out and everybody had to be ready. Of course, they had everybody sell their belongings. We took our 11 room house, emptied, emptied all the rooms and took them all down. And uh, the auctioneer came and uh, sold everything. We got $45 out of the Jesus. whole 20, 11 room house furnishings. Jeez. And uh, about three donkeys. And the Turks took two donkeys away from us. That just, just took everything, took everything. And, that, and that's early. That's early in this uh, genocide, you know, as far as the World War I portion of it. My God, man. Uh, go to uh, vhaonline.usc.edu if you want to watch the rest of Alice's interview. There, there's so many others. So glad so much of this was documented before the survivors died. Uh, you know, not all of the interviews, interviewees are Armenian, by the way. Some are foreign soldiers who, you know, witnessed atrocities. Some are relief workers, missionaries, descendants of survivors, etc. Never deny, never forget. Hail Nimrod. Let's head to today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Armenian genocide was led by the Young Turks and its leaders, Talat, Enver, and Samal. The three Pashas. Three Stooges during World War I because they thought it was a good time to answer the Armenian question. 
Number two, on the eve of World War I, there were two million Armenians in the declining Ottoman Empire. By 1922, fewer than 400,000. Today, in present-day Turkey, less than 50,000. Number three, the government of Turkey continues to deny the Armenian genocide. Over 100 years later, continues to maintain that the acts of violence, you know, just random, unfortunate, but not part of some kind of systemic program, a claim that is easily disproven by massive amounts of evidence. You know, they're, they're good guys, you know, if you're, if you're a Turkish Muslim. If you're not, they're pretty much the worst. Number four, the Armenians were not the only ones to suffer under the Young Turks, Greeks, Assyrians, other Christians, as well as Kurds, and I'm sure several others we just didn't have time to look at also suffered immensely during this time. And number five, new info, Kim Kardashian and System of a Down, the Kardashians and the original members of that metal band that need to please put out a new album already are all Armenian Americans. And they've all worked hard to raise awareness about the Armenian genocide. When the Wall Street Journal published an ad from a group of Armenian genocide deniers in 2016, Kardashian called them out. They defended the right to publish ads by those with, quote, provocative viewpoints. Kardashian wrote a letter that she posted that stated, advocated the denial of a genocide by the country responsible for it. That's not publishing a provocative viewpoint. That's spreading lies. It's totally morally irresponsible, and most of all, it's dangerous. If this had been an ad denying the Holocaust or pushing some 9-11 conspiracy theory, would it have made it to print then? She also raised money for the Armenian Education Foundation based in Glendale and continues to raise money for them. Uh, System of a Down released their first two tracks, their first two tracks in 15 years last November, Protect the Land and Genocidal Humanoids. I've been listening to them about nonstop for the last 24 hours. Great fucking songs. Still got it. And the proceeds from the songs have gone to aid Armenians via the Armenia Fund in a war that ended, uh, or, you know, for a war that ended on November 10th, 1920. Uh, fighting broke out last September in the Nargorno Karabakh, mostly ethnic Armenian region of uh, Azerbaijan. A previous war ended with a ceasefire in the region in 1994, and then it, you know, uh, was under Armenian control. Now Azerbaijan took the land back. There are fears that local uh, Armenians are again being subjugated to war crimes, according to the UN. There are reports of beheadings and other atrocities. Uh, Azerbaijan is 97% Turkish Muslim and who supported Azerbaijan in attacking Christian Armenians a few months ago, Turkey. It just doesn't stop. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Armenian genocide has been sucked. Uh, Eye-opening stuff. Man, did not know much about Turkey before this episode. Now I guess I'll actively just root for their current government crumbling and hope that uh, a new regime won't just be more of the same old shit. Man, such a shame. Such a beautiful part of the world. So much history. Too bad so much of it is bloody. And uh, <laughs> I'm guessing this is going to end up being a longer episode. We tried to summarize it so much. There's so much information. It's hard to figure out what to keep in, what to leave out. But you definitely got the gist of what has been going on there. Uh, and it's just crazy that it continues to be denied and hidden and not really that known about. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help of making Time Suck every week. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, the script keeper, Zach Flannery, Sophie Fax Sorceress, Evans, Bitelixer, Logan Art Warlock, Keith, running badmagicmerch.com, working on the socials with Liz Hernandez. Uh, thanks to all those who've joined the Cult of the Curious private Facebook group, over 25,000 members, getting all yip yip on there. Uh, thanks to Liz Hernandez and her all-seeing eyes running the Cult of Curious Facebook page, Cult of the Curious. And thanks to everyone on Discord over there making friends. Uh, also, congrats to Tallman winning round seven of the Time Suck Trivia on the app. Hail Nimrod to you, sir. Round eight began last week. Next week on Time Suck, we go to hell. Gosh dang. But not a real one, like this week. No fictional hell. Specifically, we will dig into Dante's Inferno. Written in the early 14th century by Italian politician Dante Alighieri. I didn't look up his name for this preview, but I'll, I'll look it up next week. I think that's it. I'll work on it next week. Uh, Inferno is the first part of a poetic trilogy called The Divine Comedy, the story of one man's journey through the realms of the afterlife, hell, purgatory, heaven. Dante, who double features as the poem's writer and narrator, is lost and alone in the dark in a forbidding forest on his spiritual journey. He must visit the three realms of the afterlife, beginning with hell, a.k.a. the Inferno. We'll follow Dante in his descent as he meets some sinners, many of them notable figures from history, and a few people Dante just personally didn't like. And uh, some of mythology's most fearsome monsters leading up to the big guy himself, Satan. The book has shaped the modern world's depiction of hell more than the actual Bible. It's one of the most famous and influential books of all time. It influenced the Reformation and the Renaissance. Seven centuries after it was created, it's still a very relevant exploration into the nature of evil. Maybe it'll help us uh, understand the Young Turks. Tune in next week for more history and I think probably quite a bit more joking around. 
than I felt comfortable doing this week. Uh, fiction tends to lead itself to more funny than horror. Real horror. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker updates. I'm going to start off with some interesting food for thought regarding the Operation Paperclip Suck coming in from Jackie Berry, who wrote, Hey, Suckmaster. I wanted to write in after listening to the Operation Paperclip Suck a bit late, I know. And I had a question for you. That's never too late for updates. Had a question for you. Even though I find allowing people who tortured, experimented on, and murdered innocent people to continue living just because of the possibility of using their knowledge for your own good disgusting, a very tiny part of me understands it. But I always struggle with the question of can a really good act outweigh a really bad one? The example that comes to mind for me personally is Oskar Schindler, someone who was an active part of the Nazi party and openly murdered people for sport, but ended up saving a total of 1,200 people from concentration camps. Does his saving of those people outweigh the evil of killing others? Should you be punished for the evil or rewarded for the good? As a Christian myself, I've always believed in the power of forgiveness. However, I think that there are some things that just can't be forgiven, or at least can't be forgiven by human beings, and I think that's fair. We'd love to know your thoughts. Please keep on doing what you're doing. You've got me through countless hours of research, work, homework, and studying. I'm almost finished with college because of it. Truly believe I couldn't have done it without the suck. Oh, that's very nice. Hail Nimrod. What is up, Lucifina? Belly scratches for good boy Bo Jangles. Sincerely, Jackie B. Well, Jackie B., uh, congrats on wrapping up school. Glad the suck could help. Can the good outweigh the bad? I struggle with that one as well. I think I've come to the same conclusion you seem to have come to. As far as Oscar Schindler... I don't know that he, I don't know that he did ever murder anyone. I tried to look into that. He worked as a German spy in Czechoslovakia for an organization that specialized in foreign espionage, not on any of the final solution bullshit, as far as I can tell uh, at quick glance. Uh, so he might be a lot easier specifically to forgive than others who, who hurt a lot more than helped. But yeah, but I, but I understand your question. How much can one or should one be forgiven? You know, we learned in a different update that one woman who, op, uh, who was operated on by, doc, by Dr. Mengele, the Nazi, forgave him later, one of those twins, you know, powerful stuff. Could I have done that? I don't think so. Uh, I think personally, for me, punishment and forgiveness can coexist. Or like, like, like you could forgive uh, a Nazi or one of the young Turks, I think, and also execute them at the end of the day. Uh, because we still need to be held, in my opinion, accountable for our actions. And when you butcher, you know, even one innocent man, woman, or child, you know, just ruthlessly, I think you've crossed a moral line that you can't uncross and that you, if you're not executed, a, a bad precedent has been set in society. But that's just my opinion. And I'm less tolerant when it comes to this kind of stuff than many. And I know we can go into like how, you know, they don't, don't always get it right in the courts and how there's all that. But I, but just in, in a hypothetical situation, if you know somebody did some bad thing, should they be executed? Yep. Can they also be forgiven? I, I think also, yes, in a way. Um, but again, I'm less tolerant than a lot of people when it comes to that. I think the maximum term limit some South American and Nordic nations have, for example, when someone can commit the worst of atrocities and then walk free in 20 years, I think that's fucking insane. Uh, but I don't know if I'm right. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of righteous vengeance more than forgiveness in certain circumstances. Maybe that makes me a bit of a savage myself. Uh, not sure if that helps, but I appreciate you making me think, Jackie. I, I think we've come to the same conclusion. Uh, now for a quick update. It made me very happy. Laughing Sack Brent Olbert wrote, uh, all the people that love the dad joke must not have written it. <laughs> I loved it. The longer it went on, I started legit laughing out loud. Just want to let you know that one didn't fall totally flat. Keep on sucking. Fuck yeah. Thank you, Brent. I've gotten more of those emails. Cracks me up to think about how long it could go, go on you know, before my dad finds out. Uh, thank you. And I will say, you know, even with recent events, you know, that's been going on, like some of the Kurd stuff I mentioned with the, uh, the Turkish government now. <sighs> I don't, I don't know, you know, that my dad hasn't been a part of that, you know, with a hundred percent certainty is all I'm saying. I don't know that he's not a member of the Turkish government, a hundred percent for sure. Cause I don't know where he is at all times, you know, uh, now for a heavy, but ultimately heartwarming update on an old update, been through the fucking ringer meat sack. Carrie Lachance writes, I first emailed you after the pedophile Island suck about an ongoing case involving my father molesting my daughter. Oh yeah. God, oh, geez. After three years of, uh, of, con uh, contuances continuances. Oh man, sorry. I thought I had that word when I read it. And now that I try to say it, I'm like, I don't know. Continuances. There we go. COVID delays and other legal loophole bullshit. We finally got our day in court. My father was found guilty on one kind of first degree statutory sodomy, one kind of first degree child molestation sentenced to 40 years. I'm experiencing very mixed emotions. I'm happy for justice for my daughter, but my father at 75 years old, <clears throat> excuse me, was just sentenced to die in prison. I have to remind myself he did this. Several Facebook groups, including the cult of the curious have been very supportive of me throughout this entire nightmare. So I want to thank them and especially you for keeping me smiling through the darkest years of my life. 
Can you please give a shout out to my daughters, Re uh, Reagan and Roseline, and my wife, Katie? My ladies were amazing through this, respectfully, Carrie. Wow, Carrie. Uh, so glad the Cult of the Curious has been there for you during such a nightmare. Uh, so glad a big chapter of that nightmare is closed. Uh, glad I could help you smile, Reagan and Roseline. What, what, a, what a strong parent you have. Sorry life has shown you, uh, you know, too much darkness. And I hope you have so much light coming down the pipe. And hello, Katie. Hope 2021 brings, you know, all for you so much laughter, so many smiles. Nimrod and Lucifina say you're all tough as fuck. And they respect the shit out of your strength. And now, funny sack Jen just called me out. Coming in hot with a subject line of don't be a pussy. Let me share. Jen writes, hello to the great God Amway, purveyor of fine, low cost, and high quality home cleaning products and tasty energy bars. And to no one else. I love it. Uh, just finished listening to your Denver airport suck, and you mentioned in passing that the thought of flying on propeller planes freaks you the fuck out. I've been a flight attendant on one of those propeller, propeller planes, Bombardier Q400, for the last five plus years for the regional division of a Canadian airline. And let me tell you, you have nothing to fear. We have come leaps and bounds from the days of sharing your seat with uncaged chickens, a la Indiana Jones, with regards to safety. Statistically, you're much safer on a smaller propeller plane than you are on a jet. Is that true? But I don't usually tell people that because they just freak out about being on jets as opposed to prop planes then. And being that my job is in customer service, I can't tell them not to be pussies either. <laughs> I've been extremely fortunate enough to keep my job and continue flying throughout this pandemic despite over 3,000 of my coworkers losing their jobs. Wow. 2020 was a fucking rough year for Canadian aviation and 2021 isn't looking like it's going to shape up any better unless our prime minister gets his head of glorious hair out of his firm peach-shaped butt. <laughs> but I digress. If you read this on the pod, please give a shout out to all my aviation family who are all hurting big time in the great white north. Stay strong. Not sorry about the length or girthiness of this email. I know you can take it, you pussy. <laughs> Much love and hail Lucifina Jen. Jen, you are hilarious. I love the way you wrote all that. Uh, yes, my heart goes out to everyone in the aviation uh, you know, industry, not just in Canada, up, up there in the great north, but uh, worldwide. Your industry has been gutted by the global pandemic. I, I hope you know many of you can as many of you as possible can weather this crazy storm and we get back to some sense of normalcy soon. I hope, I hope there's a huge travel boom. Uh, I hope it happens soon and I'll try and be less of a pussy when it comes to prop planes. I'll try and support all kinds of planes. Keep on sucking up North. Uh, one more today. Super sucker, Kenny. No idea how to say your last name, Kenny. Dogavitas? Dogavitas. Sounds like gingivitis the way I want to say it. As a new update, has a new update on an old suck. He writes, Hey Dan, just finished the Casey Anthony suck and decided to Google her to see if there's anything new. Boy, was I stunned when I saw a week old headline. Casey Anthony wants to open PI firm to help others wrongfully accused. The audacity of this bitch. Hopefully she opens and <laughs> hopefully she opens and one of her detectives finds def definitive proof of what she did. Keep on sucking. Man, Kenny, I clicked the link. I read the article you sent me. Yeah, it's unreal. I, I may have shared details related to this a while back because she was thinking about doing this a while ago. Uh, if, it's, if it's redundant, I apologize. But as reported on January 28th, Casey Anthony, the woman who strongly seems to have once killed her toddler, filed paperwork in Florida to open a personal investigation firm. She won't technically be able to be an investigator herself, though, because she can't get a PI license because she's a convicted felon. But that doesn't mean she can't own or run a PI firm. Like you, Kenny, I hope she can find evidence to put herself in prison for life. That'd be a great end of that story. Hail Nimrod, thanks to everyone for their messages. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening, Meat Sacks. Uh, more Bad Magic Productions content every week if you want to hear it. Uh, Spooks was scared to death on Tuesday nights. Silliness with Is We Dumb, Wednesdays at noon Pacific time. Also, if you want less darkness, little inspiration nuggets every morning, Monday through Friday with incredible feats. Please don't commit genocide this week or pretend the Turks did not. Please do keep on sucking. <laughs> Whew. Uh, hey, Joe, Joe, can you come in here? Yeah. I'm going to need you to host the show for a little while, just for a couple of years while I go into hiding. Right. Okay. Um. <laughs> um. Hell Nimrod. I'm Dan. My dad killed somebody. <laughs> squeaky, squeaky, squeaky. <laughs>